Good morning. My name is Reinaldo Rivera, director of marketing bachelor in the School of Communication and on behalf of the Universidad Austral. Welcome to our executive seminar on the emerging marketing paradigms. We have more than 2,000 participants around the world. This is an important day for our university. We are officially launching in Buenos Aires and Rosario a whole ecosystem guided by the humanistic marketing paradigm introduced by Professor Kotler and Forge. Now I hand over to Luis Aloisio from our agribusiness center in Rosario and then to our MC Francisco Aldaya. Good morning. Thank you, Reinaldo Luis. We are honored to have you attending this seminar from Buenos Aires, Rosario, and several other cities in Latin America. I'm an alumni of this university, and for the last three years, I've been working at BloombergLinia.com, which is a partnership with Bloomberg News that caters to a C-level audience across Latin America, covering finance, business, economy, politics, in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. Throughout this event, we'll be joined by prestigious academic and executive speakers. In order to abide by our tight schedule, introductions will be short, and we will upload speakers' profiles as well as any relevant information to the event's official website. I now want to introduce Professor Valdemar Porch, co-author of the groundbreaking book, H2H Marketing. He is currently a senior marketing professor at the University of Limassol in Cyprus and is renowned for his contributions to international management and B2B marketing. Professor Porch, the floor is yours to enlighten us on some of the main concepts behind human-to-human -human marketing. Professor Porch, I think you're on mute. All right, here I'm back. Thank you for letting me join you at the conference. Do you see my screen? Okay, I, okay let me share again. All right, does not share, one second. Stop sharing. Is, do you see the do you see this my screen? Well, let me move on. Now we oh, do, yeah. Professor Porch. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for having me here. I would like to give you a short introduction on the emergence of H to H marketing, since uh, we are so happy to uh, introduce this new concept. Um, this was established. Um, in 2021 and uh, with the publication of this new book. In a couple of days, we will have um, a Spanish version, actually a Latin American version, which emphasizes the uh, groundbreaking work which Phil Kotler, Uwe Sponholz and myself have done with the H2H -H marketing, the genesis of human to human marketing. And uh, with the Spanish translation, uh, launched by the University of Astral, we present a huge paradigm shift and uh, hopefully we can 
have a major influence on the local market situation. This will be the cover of the book. And um, in addition, there will be some extra publication around it. Let me go into the development of the marketing management of the last uh, 50 years, which is very important because the marketing science, which is an art and a science, uh, was introduced by Philip Kotler, which we'll talk today later on. And he started in the late 60s with his famous marketing management book. Today we have the 16th edition. Um, and this edition uh, has incorporated some of the work which we have done together. And this work is actually the basis for our thinking now, where we have various other things to consider. So marketing management is the essence of understanding the uh, management of marketing in uh, the companies. In the last couple of years, we were talking about marketing 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, actually, which was published in the book, Marketing 3.0. Then came a 4.0, which uh, was including the digital aspects, and then a 5.0, which technology business until and humanity. And today we have the marketing 6.0. And uh, hopefully Phil Kotler will give you some more insights on that because this concept is uh, complementary to the H2H -H marketing concept. So let's get a little bit deeper in this concept because human to human marketing is something new. It is built on service dominant logic means that we are putting solutions in the foreground. It is based on design thinking, which means that innovation is driven by human-oriented um, uh, new things, and the digitalization, which is here to stay. All this together creates the basic model of the H2H uh, uh, marketing. It also includes a specific mindset which is necessary to make this H2H -H marketing possible, but also the management of this um, procedure and the processes. So this all together is the basic model. So you have a new marketing, which cares about the people in the way they serve new ideas through design thinking, new innovations. They are part of the digitalization, which is the reality today, and they look for solutions. And that solution part is actually a very important part because many companies are still in the goods dominant logic, which means they put the product in the foreground. But in the meantime, many things have changed. We have a very strong individualization in the people in the people, but also how we serve the market. And we have a dematerialization. And um, almost everybody sees that dematerialization. Let me give you a short example. When I was uh, listening to music in uh, my young days, I had LPs, then I had CDs, then I had an MP3 player, and today we are streaming, which means we don't need too much equipment to have the possibility to enjoy music, which means actually we don't want the music, we want the service of the most music, which is characterized by a principle which is called service dominant logic um, or solution selling. So these two differences are very important to understand. The old logic is prevalent everywhere we talk about tension product, we talk about standardization, mass production, focus on operant measurable um, resources and output. We make and sell. At the end, in the goods dominant logic, firms produce value, which they sell, and the customer destroys it. That is the concept of goods dominant logic. But today we know the situation is different. We have lots of intangibles. I explained the example of music. You can go much further. Um, we are lo looking at a high uh, individualization rate. We look at uh, operant, knowledgeable resources and processes, and customers and firm.
co-create value only through the participation of com companies and uh, customers value is created and that new concept has major impact on how we organize our marketing activities so this is the principle and the other principles are very clear let me go a little bit deeper in these three major aspects of the new h2h marketing which brings up a new mindset which means that design thinking is clearly human centered and all the things what happening is done on an experimental day uh, in an iterative innovative an innovation process let me give you the example of apple when they bring uh, a new uh, hardware the adaptation of the software is continuously going and today we have um, iphone version 16 point something um, and every day we have a new improvement and uh, all the things what the company learned from the customers requirements are built in and this is clearly based on a marketing which has deep customer insights so this design thinking gives us the opportunity and it's the overall need that we really understand what the customer wants and if we uh, um, um, serve the customer accordingly, of course, the success is not far away. The digitalization is a technological prerequisite because with the digitalization, we can, each, we can reach each and everybody. Um, there is an ongoing trend of dematerialization. I gave you an example for that. And there's the increased importance of trust. I mean, in the old days, we had trust to people. Today, we don't see people so much. So the mechanism in between has to be a trusted procedure. And brands like Amazon have built up this kind of trust. Um, and the companies who are following that, they also need to be strong in this area. So digitalization as prerequisite. And then again, coming back to the service dominant logic idea, which is the conceptual foundation of H2H marketing. It sees value co-creation in a collaborative ecosystem. So you have to look around not only to customer and companies, but also to the other players in the ecosystem. You have to interact with them, you have to build it. And of course, there's a huge importance of customer experience, CX. And that customer experience, number one, has to be understood and has to be served. So what we see here is that the principles, the new principles of H2H marketing are actually very different from traditional marketing. But on the other hand, the successful companies today are using it. And if you want to be successful, you better understand the principles and apply it. Well, H2H marketing comes to Latin America. The situation is very different there, uh, but H2H marketing gives the possibility because it emphasizes cultural relationships and, uh, H2H model, and the H2H model aligns with the strong emphasis on personal relationship, trust, and human connection in the Latin American societies. And therefore, I'm very confident that this, this will help. It also sees the differentiated customer experience in the various places, countries, and locations. So H2H marketing enables personalized and engaging experiences for Latin American customers. In addition, trust building and brand loyalty is crucial. So authentic communication and relationship building forces trust and lead to increased brand loyalty in Latin America if you apply the H2H marketing concept. Therefore, you need to understand a little bit more. One of the principles of the book, I mean, there are many principles, I'm just uh, taking a few for you, is the so-called customer pass. We also can call it customer journey. We call it customer pass because we are considering physical and digital touch points, which is very important because we live in the um, world where digitalization has a big uh, reality and we have to consider that. Nevertheless, all products, all services have to be brought to awareness 
of the customer. The customer must appeal before it goes to action. Actually, then it will start asking and then comes the action. And hopefully, when he likes the product, he will advocate and bring it back. This new principle is quite different from the marketing funnel. And therefore, we think that the customer path is a very important tool to understand and to execute the customer relationship and the path of the customer through it. And therefore, the various touch points has to be administrated, has to be managed, has to be put in the forefront. There are many possibilities for this kind of touch points. Um, I've brought you some examples. And uh, uh, in many cases, um, public relations is a starting point. You may have uh, paid a radio, TV, or print advertisement. Um, word of mouth is much uh, uh, cheaper and uh, often profounder. But on the website, you, on the on the digital side, you can have web banners. You can have websites. You use social media, and then uh, if it appeals, you go to a most possible contact center. You talk to family and friends. You maybe go to the store. And then uh, you look at the websites, you look at content sites, you look at free reviews, and then you start thinking about it and buying it. So you may go on, on e-commerce or you go on the website, you go to the store, um, and then you uh, purchase it and have it on whatever means you do. Um, and then uh, there's a post-purchase service necessary. And of course, then you, you advocate through various means. This is a principal uh, uh, example of touch points. If you look into uh, the touch points, you probably notice that uh, email is missing. Well, that was uh, a conscious decision here, but you could put it in and maybe email could be the starting point or email could be uh, the point where um, the customer uh, exchanging between the, their friends and it's not word of mouth. An email could even be the purchasing act. So there could be various different ways of doing that. But the important part is to understand what is my customer pass for my groups. Actually, we are not only looking at groups, segments, we are looking at individuals. And with the age to age marketing, actually, the individual approach is preferred. But of course, you have to be capable to make this happen. This is a very important principle of the age to age marketing. And we also say there are big advantages if you do it right, because if you do it right, the customer comes back and purchases. And normally they go through the uh, steps of the past and it may take some time and it may take some efforts, but the important things, what we recognize, if you have a very strong connection to your customer, you can actually jump over various uh, steps of the past, which means the loyalty, and uh, in the picture you see, we call that loyalty loop, gives you the possibility that you really execute a very loyal behavior. I mean, I mentioned um, Apple customers, and uh, uh, you know, when you have uh, uh, bought your first uh, iPhone, you buy uh, the second one, the third one, and now finally you had iPhone uh, 15, and then uh, you still enjoy it, and you don't ask. Uh, you have to check the features of the next generation. No, you might, because you know, uh, you trust them. And that loyalty loop is actually a very important part. So when company can establish this kind of loyalty loop, they are pretty close to their customers. Well, there are other elements which are important for the new h 2 h marketing. The next example or the next principle I'll bring here is the so-called marketing mix. And uh, everybody of you, everybody who is here knows the four Ps. And you probably also know that it was introduced by McCarthy after Borden has established the term marketing mix in 1964. And that four Ps are still here. I'll come back to that because it's still an important principle 
and uh, Phil Kotler has publicized that strongly and brought it forward. And many people understand that as the basic principle of marketing. For me and for every author of the H8 book, it is one principle because in the meantime, many things have changed. And there was the seven Ps and then Lauterbaum brought the four Cs. And the four Cs and the, is a very important one says the four elements of the customers. And I'll get back to you. So the perspective changed. There came some more improvement over the years, uh, 5V, 7P, 4S and so on. And uh, myself, I introduced in 2017, the five E's which brings now a dynamic perspective. And that change is very suitable for the HUH marketing since HUH marketing is dynamic based on digitalization, which means I can change anything at every second and I can have instant communication. So therefore the marketing companies need also a marketing mix which reacts uh, in real time. So when you look at the four Ps, I mean, it's pretty clear, product, place, promotion, price. These are the abstract aggregation of marketing activities of companies. And of course, it's a simplification, but nevertheless, it clearly gives us the opportunity to understand and act um, relatively clear. Out of that comes then the new uh, principle, and I mentioned the four Cs. And the four C's look at customer wants, they look at convenience, they look at communication, and they look at cost. And these costs are actually um, the total cost of the customer, where the customer um, pays for the price, but also pays for the transportation, his uh, other aspects, and uh, of course also the effort he is taking. And now we move um, to the uh, next uh, marketing mix principle, which is the five E's. And uh, I just see that the communication on the screen is a little bit slow. So I have to slow down and see that we are now uh, seeing the arrow and then comes hopefully in two seconds, uh, the symbol of the 5E, which yes, here it is. And the 5 E's consist out of knowledge and we talk and not communication, right? And not promotion. We talk about exchange of knowledge. And uh, that exchange of knowledge is very important because the exchange of knowledge is an ongoing procedure. And that ongoing procedure um, gives us, number one, the information from the company, but at the same time, the company gets the information from us. And with the knowledge that they have, they can move on. And we are not looking at price or cost. We are looking at value. And what we want, we want to expand the value. So we want to do something which is um, different from the things what we offered before. So having a better value gives us the opportunity to have a better offering. The next step is in this marketing mix, the solution, which is um, product in the four Ps, customer wants in the uh, um, four Cs. And today we call it solution. And what we actually want is an involvement of the solution. So an increasement of the things. So a better solution than today. So if you have, as I mentioned before, iPhone 15, there may be version iPhone 15 one or two or three. And then comes the channel. We want to extend the channels. We are not only want to buy it online and in the shop. We also want to buy it uh, in the different electronic shops. We want to buy it uh, through the service personnel. We want to buy it. You ever, what you can imagine what you want to do is you want to move on. And this extension of the channels has not ended yet. There may be other forms 
um, of channels coming up. Let's say 3 p 3, 3, 3 printing for hardware, holographic uh, appearances uh, for uh, software music uh, entertainment. And then, of course, we look at the ultimate thing, what we have today, the brand. What we want is continuous engagement or expanded engagement with the brand. If you are a loyal um, customer, um, number one, you love the brand, but you also engage. That means you use the product and show it to other people. You administrate if you move it forward. So what you have in front of you are three marketing mix. I'm not saying that one or the other one is better because it, they all have a different function. You may start with the four Ps and move to the four Cs and then implement the five Es or the other way around. What I'm saying is the H2H marketing needs a more complex marketing mix and it needs a marketing mix which continually grows. And also in the middle of the marketing mix, of the five E's is the brand. In the other marketing mix, brands were not relevant. I mean, brands were there and they were part of the product. But today we are not buying only the product, we are actually buying much more. And therefore, brand management in the h h marketing is a very important part. And we see brand management uh, from two sides, number one from the company side and number two from the customer side. The company has an identity and the customer sees the image and both things have to come together. Both things have to be on the same level. So the company offers a brand promise and the customer wants a brand needs and out of that uh, if they fit if they meet at the same place it actually uh, push the stuff forward so what we have um, um, uh, when brand promise brand needs and brand behavior and brand experience meet then we have touch points which are very similar to the touch points of the customer pass but they have to be managed in a very different way. They have to be managed according to the branding principles which the company is actually using for their um, appearance in the market. So what you hear here is that h h marketing emphasizes strong brand management and this brand management has various principles. I brought you one and I think that is one of the important one. If you apply that, you will see it has major impact um, for your uh, appearance in the market and for your interaction with the customer. Now, when you see that, we move on to the H2H marketing in action. And then H2H marketing um, has the opportunity to be present in uh, various countries. Um, I'm happy that we are now talking about the Latin American uh, Spanish-speaking uh, countries. There also will be a Portuguese version, but also we have um, similar activities done in China, in Japan, and other places, which means that you, are, you have to tailor your marketing strategies to media and multimedia, uh, multinational corporation uh, uh, proposals, which engaging with the shareholders. And we have to build up uh, trust and longevity so that marketing has the possibility to foster trust and becomes a pivotal element for ensuring sustaining success in diverse markets. So cultural attuned strategy and trusted and longevity is very important to make H2H um, -H marketing apply. Similar to uh, the, the, print, the basic uh, marketing communication models, H2H -H marketing um, uh, emphasizes the use of strategic planning and tries to help to develop a comprehensive plan 
for integrating marketing and communication. Well, this is standard, but of course, as I said, it is very specific because it has a digital dimension, which means that we also have to introduce something what is new, which is the digital storytelling. And we have to have the opportunity for analytics and uh, optimization. And uh, this optimization um, is on both sides, on the uh, company side, also on the customer side. So both elements are important to uh, foster the development. Nevertheless, Professor Porch, the, just one minute left, sorry. Yes, thank you, I'll be almost done. Um, the future of uh, uh, our marketing models is based on a very customer-centric approach and the adaptability and diversity uh, um, recognition and finally on innovative uh, uh, aspects. All right, so we have this. And uh, the innovative aspects is very important because HH embraces innovative technology and enhances marketing models and all the strategies. What we would like to initiate for the marketing future is critical thinking, which means in the world where we are now, it is very important to encourage an exploration of innovative and critical marketing concepts because we are living in a not easy world and that requires from each customer to be aware of the reality. We also need to look at cultural relevance and uh, have to adapt to the conditions. Well, <clears throat> the HH book was a start. The translation into Spanish will give us a deeper possibility to, ex to expand the knowledge in the various uh, um, Spanish-speaking countries. But in addition to that, there is much more to do. I actually would like to encourage uh, professors and also students to come up um, with uh, case studies. We have a case studies uh, selection and we have an uh, instructor's manual for the professors. And uh, hopefully then we can uh, um, distribute and diminish uh, the uh, distribution of the knowledge to all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Universidad of Astral, to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Professor, Professor Porch. Solamente una aclaración para los que están siguiendo por Zoom, que pueden eh, elegir el idioma. O sea, si lo están escuchando en inglés, pueden cambiar a, a español. So our next speaker is Frank Mulhern, who will delve into the field of integrated marketing and communications. Professor Mulhern uh, currently serves as the Associate Dean of Research at the prestigious Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University in the U.S. Mulhern specializes in researching the economics of marketing, the impact of new media technologies on marketing communications, and the measurement of the impact of advertising and promotion, particularly in retail environments. He is the co-author of the textbook, Marketing Communications, Integrated Theory, Strategy, and Tactics. Uh, Professor Mulhern, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so are my slides there or should I pull them up and share my screen? Hi, Frank. Uh, you could share your screen or we could upload. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so okay. okay. It's better if I share my screen. I, I will need to be uh, a co-host. Yeah. 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 You will be the co-host in one second. Thank you for coming, Frank. Okay. So the slides are online already, so you could... And now you are sharing the, the your screen.
Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go, go with the service. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so, good, good morning, morning, everyone. I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and share some thoughts with you about integrated marketing communications. Uh, I'm at Northwestern University in the Medill School, which is a media school. Uh, there's two parts of this school. We have journalism and we have integrated marketing communications. And I was the associate dean in charge of that program for many, many years. Uh, and I rotated out of that. I'm going to give a brief history and overview of marketing, integrated marketing communications. As you will see, I will connect at several points to what Professor Waldemar had to tell us. Uh, and I will end up with some thoughts on more humanistic approaches to marketing. Uh, so Northwestern University had a, in fact, the leading advertising program in the United States through the 70s and 80s. And in 1989, they added direct marketing as a specialization and changed the name of it to Integrated Marketing Communications in 1991. Uh, originally, it was meant to take these four sub areas of marketing communications, advertising, sales promotion, direct marketing, and public relations, and quote, integrate them or kind of converge them into more holistic, synergistic approaches to, to conducting, conducting marketing, marketing communication. So, so I'll, 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 maybe I would just call it tactical, tactical integration. integration. Uh, along, along came the internet in the 1990s, 1990s and our program happened to be in this, this direct, direct marketing, marketing space, space where we were already working with one-to-one -one communications, direct, direct response, response large-scale large customer database. databases. So this, this all fit all very much into the emerging field of what we now largely call Digital marketing, I don't think we're going to stop calling it that because everything is becoming digital or digitally connected. Um, as I said, IFC originally mentioned coordination across media. Often this is now called omni-channel marketing or multi-channel marketing. Uh, but I want to talk some now about how the, the subfield integrated marketing communication has really evolved much more beyond this tactical coordination. Uh, kind of in the last, next phase as we evolve towards where we are today and in the future that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, we talked a lot about the growth and availability of consumer and retail data through this digitalization. Uh, data is very much at the heart of what we do as an academic field and, as a, and for our industry applications. Uh, we have a very strong focus on customers and insights, uh, what we call an outside in approach. So as opposed to organizations thinking about what they produce and sell and go to the market, we like to come at it first from the consumer's point of view, what the consumers want, and we understand their world and ultimately how brands fit into the worlds of how consumers live their lives, not just as shoppers and buyers. Moving, Moving more towards the science, science of marketing communication, communication with a strong emphasis on measurement and ROI connecting, connecting to financial outcomes. outcomes. <laughs> um, as, as I mentioned, an outside in approach, approach, a very, very large, large focus, focus on technology. technology. We have had that for quite a while. And of course, now we are all dealing with emerging, emerging technologies and changing technologies. technologies. These include all the various, various devices, devices, in particular mobile, mobile devices, devices, but also, also the technology and the platforms, platforms through which brands engage and conduct their, their relationships with their consumers. Uh, uh, we're now we're moving again to more continuous process models with continuous adjustment based on data and feedback and metrics and outcomes of marketing and communication spending. Uh, today, uh, today, we're really, really getting really away from, from looking at integrated marketing communication of a combination of a set of marketing, of marketing communication tactics and thinking of it much more of, of a strategic communication process. process. And, and this, this is, is where it connects to what you've already heard mentioned today, 
things like service dominant logic, logic uh, which, uh, which is, is very, very, which is in many ways all an alternative conceptualization of many of the same, same things, things that we do in integrated marketing communications. communications. And again, again, the big, big focus, focus is on prioritizing the consumer and the consumer experience. Uh, more, more recently, recently I, have, uh, I recently gave a talk on this. Um, integration, integration, even as I've talked about, about it so far, largely emphasizes emphasize marketing, marketing communications practices and how we coordinate them and create a systematic, holistic experience for consumers. I like to also use the word integration to, to do it in a different direction and talk so about how brands get integrated into the consumer's world. And that requires a true understanding of the consumer experience, not just as shoppers, but as everything else. It applies in business to business, as well as business to consumer marketing. And this whole idea of how do we integrate our brand and our service experiences into the consumer's world. And we are getting more and more towards this, particularly because of the data availability which I will, I will talk, talk about, about in a few slides, slides that I believe are dramatically going to overhaul the whole, the whole way, way we approach marketing communications. communications. And not, not just marketing market communications, communications, all of marketing. Uh, this, this is a way, way overly long definition. definition. It's kind of an interesting story about where this came about. I did write it, uh, but I do want to highlight the um, italicized words there that kind of, that should capture really the essence of what IMC uh, is all about. Uh, so first of it, the strategic process. In the world of marketing communications, historically things were done in terms of campaigns. And to some extent, a lot of that still happens. We get away from that. We get more towards overall strategic processes that are ongoing. They're not campaigns that have a fixed beginning, a fixed finish, a measurement period, and then, and then you restart, restart and do it all again. Uh, we have a strong focus on driving organizational performance. performance. Largely, that, that means, means financial outcomes if it's a for-profit organization, organization, but it could certainly mean other outcomes for governments, governments and nonprofits, nonprofits and whatnot. And, and we do, do so by engaging, engaging, serving, and communicating with consumers and other constituents. constituents. The, other the other constituents is something, something we put a big emphasis on, uh, particularly in the strategic communications world but the idea yeah, of integrating employees into the brand communication process, uh, the, the public, public at large, large government, government bodies. Um, so, so, so we do have a strong emphasis on other constituents, but we primarily focus on consumers. And notice those terms, they're going to come back in a couple of slides, engaging and serving. Uh, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about terminology and how I think we need to change the terminology we use in this field. Uh, historically, it evolved, and uh, again, Professor Baltimore gave some of the history, uh, and much of it was, when I was in grad school, I believe we learned it was function. Marketing consists of a series of functions, and we're trying to get an emphasis away from that and more towards people, which of course is the theme of today's session, the more humanistic side of things. Uh, we, we, we put a big emphasis on combining qualitative understanding of consumers, that's our consumer insight research, with large-scale analytics using large customer databases. Uh, and we bring together those both qualitative and quantitative data sources to build strategic marketing communications to build strong brands. Um, and this especially is an appropriate way to do marketing communications in a digital world have so, so not, not just so, so many, many touch points, points but, but so, so much, much ability to implement, implement track uh, and, and measure, measure the impact of brand, brand communication practices on consumers, consumers and their experiences. Uh, before I get to some of the more humanistic aspects and some of where I see this going, I do want to talk about some of the challenges in industry for implementing some of the ideas that, that I have mentioned and that you also heard from the previous uh, presentation. So first, this is the first big obstacle I will call the advertising media complex. This is the advertising agencies, the media companies, even the, the client corporations, the CMOs, 
and certainly the, the marketing communication measurement firms, the ones that add TV audiences and circulation and all kinds of digital metrics. Uh, this is big business. They very much collaborate to advance their own interests. And this does not serve consumers well. Uh, because the primary focus is on how these professionals within these organizations can advance their interests of themselves and the organization. So there's, there's this fundamental conflict between trying to maximize consumers' experiences and satisfaction and maximizing uh, financial performance, uh, like we talked. And there doesn't have to be a disconnect. Those things can be done and then joined together. Uh, uh, Functionally-based organizational based structures, structures as well as agency structures continue to be an enormous problem, problem even though most marketing, marketing organizations and agencies will claim that they have uh, uh, more, more integrated, integrated management structures, structures but, you but you still see them competing for the same budget. budget. I'm doing, I'm doing quite, quite a bit, bit of work right now in the area of retail media networks, networks where, where large, large retailers, retailers are selling digital advertising to brands. And, there's a, and among the brands, there's a great deal of infighting in terms of where that money comes from. Does it come from digital advertising spending? Does it come from shopper marketing or whatnot? So there's still, still a lot of problems with the organization structure and with budget. Uh, measurements is largely around tactics, and we tend to build models to optimize the performance of marketing communication tactics. And we like to see measurement more around people Again, that falls in with the theme of being more humanistic, that we truly are measuring the impact of our brand communications on the consumers who are experiencing that. And lastly, in terms of a challenge that we're all dealing with in this business is talent. Uh, historically, the field has been dominated by people with strategic and creative skills. And while, of course, we still need them, we are in an increasingly quantitative world. I, I, I won't go into it here, but I have a, a lecture on the evolution of marketing as an academic field and how it bifurcated the quantitative and the non-quantitative, the strategy versus the quantitative, unlike other fields like economics and accounting and finance, where the quantitative parts are deeply integrated into all other aspects. And now to finish up, uh, the last couple of thoughts on the humanistic approach and a bit of a look towards the future. Uh, we, very consistent with the H2H marketing approach. We need to treat consumers as people, not purchasing agents. Even the word consumer is a problem. Consumer comes from economics where we have producers and consumers, but it purely envisions the person as someone who buys and consumes our product. And it's actually it's not, not really a very good word for a more humanistic, more humanistic approach to marketing. To marketing. And, and more generally, generally other terminologies terminology such as acquisition, acquisition retention, retention, target markets, markets any, any war, war metaphor, metaphor like shotgun, shotgun uh, and, and rifling, rifling strategies, strategies and positioning, positioning the battle for your mind. Uh, I, think I think all those are terrible terms, terms. It's good because they, they treat the consumer, the consumer as an enemy, someone we acquire. Um, we need more humanistic language, as I, I mentioned in the bottom here. Serve, engage, connect, enhance, develop, I could add, satisfy. And these are more the kind of terms we use in our regular lives for how we interact with people uh, personally. And I think the field needs to have a more humanistic approach. Uh, uh, by changing, changing some of the language. And again, the, the H2H, H2H book is a really, really terrific, terrific big step in, in that, that direction, direction to bring a more humanistic kind of thinking to the field. field. And, and lastly, lastly, a bit, a bit of a look, look towards, towards the next, next stage, stage uh, automation and AI. AI. So, so, you know, there's multiple kinds of AI and people misuse the term quite a bit. I will generally have two categories, the sort of the machine learning, deep learning side, and alternatively, and alternatively, the generative, generative AI, AI, which is where it's producing content, content uh, images, videos, videos, written text. text. All of this is dramatically going to influence the field. It already is in terms of marketing communications and how it is developed and how it is customized and how it is delivered. So we will continue to see much more of this, I would say, right now. The field is very much in a fledgling state of trying to figure out how 
to adapt, to adapt these, these new technologies, technologies both the data, data side and the generative, generative side, into the marketing processes. processes. And, and lastly, I want to mention the oncoming revolution, revolution in the field, the field that's, that's going to happen because of consumption data. data. Right, right now, now, our data, data streams end at the point of purchase. purchase. In, retailing, in retailing, that's in the store, store in e-commerce, that's in a shopping, shopping cart, cart that gets checked out. In business to business, it is generally a delivery or installation of a product into a client corporation. That's where our data ends. But now we have data on consumption. So, for example, in, in appliances that are in homes, they are connected to Wi-Fi. Uh, there's Bluetooth technologies that are used. There's RFID technologies. So companies are going to be getting consumption-level data, not just purchase-level data. And I believe this will revolutionize the quality of marketing because we will have so much more of an understanding about how people are using our products, not just how and where they are buying our products. And that finishes up my session. I think we are right on time. Thank you very much, Professor Mulhern. So we're now going to open the floor for a brief uh, Q&A session. The email has been at the bottom of the screen to send in your questions. Um, and we'll begin with one of the first that were sent in. Just opening them up. So the first question is, the CEO of Diageo stated in an article that the future of brands is to become premium and experimental. How do H2H and IMC uh, make brands valuable, valuable for customers in the era of AI? Well, if I should answer, um, the experimental part is a very clear one. Um, the H2H marketing, uh, reference that and therefore by finding out in a step-by-step -step process what the customer wants um, the company's on the right track how to get to the premium is another question but it's actually very much related to that because by understanding and focusing on the needs of the particular customer you become exclusive so you as a um, solution offering institution company it could be a university it could be something else by being so close to the customer you are becoming the institution the brand which provides the better the premium service and therefore h to h marketing by itself leads to premium part. It does not lead to luxury because luxury has different principles, but I don't want to get too into that, but providing the best service pulls you up in the range. Therefore, I think that's a great opportunity. Thank you. So the following question, uh, maybe Professor Mulhern can answer. We have people from Barrio 31, which is one of the poorest areas in Buenos Aires and in Argentina. Uh, how could marketing aid in development, in economic development and lifting people out of poverty? Well, marketing certainly is very related to economic development. And as you mentioned, lifting people out of poverty. The key there often involves physical distribution and making the products available, as well as facilitating the purposes. I have some experience uh, with some developmental work in India where the marketing work was all around payment systems to facilitate the availability of product and the ability for consumers to make purchases in what otherwise were kind of an economic structure that did not facilitate that. So marketing, so marketing I, I think a lot of, there's a lot of critics, critics of marketing that don't realize this, that marketing, marketing really, really does bring more products, more products and services, services to people who have them in a great deal of need. need. And, and it, it needs, needs to be done in conjunction, conjunction with, with 
the kind of economic development that provides people financial resources so that they actually can purchase the products that they need. Thank you, Professor Mulhern. Um, going back to sector-specific questions, I'd like to ask now either of you how H2H and IMC can be used in the agribusiness sector specifically, especially in a time of genetically modified crops and climate change. Well, this is a very substantial question, and um, the approach of humanistic marketing is not only geared to the individual, but also the uh, whole planet. Um, so you can make conscious choices if you want to uh, um, take care of the environment, the people, or not. So the H2H uh, approach is an approach, as I said before, with a mindset for the people. And if you don't want to have that, or if you don't have that mindset, of course the results are differently. But um, we think that people, decision makers, can make choices for a better environment. And uh, of course, genetic modified products have some benefits, but they also have some downsides. Um, and therefore, we have to balance that. And uh, consumers, as companies, can make this conscious decision. Next yeah, no, my dad, that the agribusiness situation is very much a business to business. Um, there's the massive organizations that grow and develop these uh, plant-based products, and then they are selling to the food manufacturers. So clearly, there's a need for both the IMC and the H two H approaches to understand those organizations and how the products that are developed, the plant-based products are developed, best match their ability to go to market. The next question. Let me add, let me add one example. Um, as uh, Frank says, uh, agro is mainly B2B, but with the digitalization, of course, we have other choices. I currently work with an essential oil producer who is using um, uh, leftover products, like from the wine production, you have the kernels, and out of the kernels, you make essential oils. And then with the digitalization, um, this kind of companies have the opportunity to directly uh, approach the final customer and can uh, go around or beyond the B2B approach and create their own market. So uh, they also opportunity for that. Thank you, Professor Porch. The next question is uh, regarding uh, H2H and IMC, which regard trust as a key issue uh, for marketing as a whole. Um, with, everything with everything seeming to be digital now, but also perceived as uh, fake or artificial in some cases, could you approach the issue of the role of communications now in business and what those paradigms could add to marketing as a discipline for contributing to uh, human flourishing and development? Uh, yeah, I'll start with that one. Um, so first of all, we start with trust. So all of us who are uh, to teach, teach marketing, marketing. Uh, put a great deal of emphasis on brands, and the essence of brands is really trust, that the consumer trusts the brand for all kinds of things in terms of quality, performance, and, and so forth. Um, as we get towards more humanistic approaches, the, the trust factor should get better in that if organizations are treating consumers more like real people, and truly understanding their experiences and how the brands fit into those, the trust should be great. And that should be good for consumers, it should be good for organizations in terms of their performance. Professor the perspective from my side is, of course, uh, what Frank says is absolutely right, um, but in a more humanistic approach, also the approach to branding is uh, changing, uh, it's pivoting to uh, the consumer side. Um, number one, consumer has more choices. And number two, we have to accept that the brand is actually owned by the consumer. If the consumer does not see the brand, 
how they are, uh, how, or how doesn't see the brand, how the company wants to see them, uh, have to, wants to be seen, um, there is a disconnect. And sometimes uh, companies don't uh, see that, and therefore the interaction, the, um, the exchange of knowledge um, is necessary. And in, um, in a very extended way, it's needed because out of that, um, the new understanding of brand management is achieved and all the actions which are necessary could be tailored to that. So, so another misconception about marketing, about marketing in general, in general is, that is that it's all about sales. sales. How do H2H H2 and, and IMC challenge that view? Yeah, yeah well, well, I think I it's pretty really apparent from the two presentations we just had that it's uh, very, very much not all about sales. And, and I do and agree that one of the legacy problems with the field is that the general public thinks of marketing as essentially sales and advertising. And we, I think, have come a very, very long way, even in terms of general marketing over the decades, and particularly with the conceptualizations that we saw this morning from the two frameworks we have brought forward. It's really all about people and people's experiences and how brands and products and services fit into those experiences. Also, as, as uh, Waldemar mentioned several times, the service dominant market has been a very strong subfield in marketing to put forward uh, approaches to the field that are not about selling and they're not even really about products, they're about consumers. Well, uh, I thought we had overcome uh, the selling as marketing principles in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, but I still, there are areas, and I'm currently living in Cyprus, which is also not so well developed, there are areas and companies who are still using the old concept, but then on the other hand, the customer has choices and they are looking for experience. And the companies who are offering this kind of experience are the companies who are becoming the dominant one and they are outperforming companies who are um, on the selling side. Of course, the market has to be as such in the position to change it. I mean, in some real estate market, it's still a pushing market. In others, it's an experience market. And therefore, it depends very much on the customer and the market situation. So moving away from the, the, the selling side is very important. Of course, when you need necessities, then every penny counts. And therefore, selling comes in the forefront again. But if you are on the uh, enjoyment side, then the experience comes on. So it's actually, we are far away from selling as basic principle of marketing. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, do either of you have any uh, concrete examples of these experiences that are being uh, done by companies that, that you think are doing a very good job so far this year? Well, there's plenty of examples out there. I'll just throw out one very common one, which is Starbucks. I mean, Starbucks markets an experience. They don't do all that much advertising. They sell through their stores, as they call them. And they put a great deal of effort into the quality of the customer experience, a great deal of employee training, and then the design, uh, as mentioned earlier this morning, the design of the locations and the seating and everything else. It's all about the experience. And that's why they can get away with charging quite high prices uh, because they have this enhanced quality experience compared to their competitors. I mean, there are many more examples. Uh, even in ice cream, you can do that. But also on high tech, when you go to uh, the Amazon online store or even the Apple online store, this is really an experience. And the packaging and the way they service you and all the follow up things. That is really great examples. And of course, the ultimate uh, customer experience is Google. Of course, it's only online, but look how fantastic our online experience is compared to the um, internet appearance 20 years ago it really improved dramatically and every time you go online you enjoy it 
I mean, it's not so cumbersome as it had been. So we are really in the age of experience. Another sector specific question, is marketing valuable for education institutions? Sometimes there's a perception that marketing applied in education is about uh, selling education. Could you offer uh, your view as scholars and educators? Well, let me congratulate Kellogg for the great marketing experience, what they have done. I mean, number one, they have established fantastic buildings, uh, teaching rooms, teaching environments. I come from a, a new co a university now, which has to do all this work. And if you have this role model, this is really Uh, yeah, and I'll add to that, and that's a great example. Um, yeah, so even Phil Cotton has a book on nonprofit marketing. I mean, marketing can work very much in nonprofits. Often people think that's not the case in education and healthcare, but educational outcomes, such as having students stay in school and improving the quality of the in school experience through marketing kinds of concepts, essentially in the service marketing area. Uh, can, can be, be very influential, influential in uh, the quality of education. Um, so, so I, I think I there's a huge role that marketing. Now, often it's not all of marketing. Uh, my, my son, son works, works in health insurance, and he runs, runs essentially what is a marketing, marketing department, and he calls it business strategy. He goes, yeah, that's, that's what they, they want to call it. it. So, so education and healthcare, they may not want to call it marketing, but they need to do these practices in order to perform what they are trying to contribute, which is educating the students. The example what I would like to give here is the executive education. And again, when you look at Kellogg as the flagship school for executive education, that is a lifelong experience. And uh, many people go there after they have worked five to 10 years. And then the way of experiencing the new knowledge, experiencing the learning of the, the colleagues and the interaction of the professor is a unique um, uh, unique situation for them, and this kind of ex ex edu uh, executive education is changing the life of many people, and I think to the good. So, a question here from Rosario, which I'll uh, live translate. Um, why do you think that we're going towards uh, a communication style that's more human? considering that it's always been about human beings. Um, is this era uh, what digital once was? Um, uh, in, in generating a greater need of contact and uh, personalization? Well, I would, argue, I would put forth that technology is allowing us to be more humanistic. Uh, the traditional, the traditional way, of way of thinking about, about that is customized communications, communications but, but I think it's more than that. that. It's, it's understanding, understanding and engaging with consumers that we're, we're now, now able, able to do uh, through, through technology. technology. Historically, Historically, we could do that through, through personal, personal sales. sales. An individual, individual salesperson and an individual client would have a very humanistic interaction. interaction. But, but since, since we've, we've moved, moved towards, towards large-scale large marketing through media channels, Traditionally, Traditionally, we've, we've lost, lost that, that, and that's, that's how, how we strayed from being humanistic. And now, and now technology, technology and the data we have enables us to be more humanistic in the way brands interact with consumers. Well, I agree to this, but of course, there are also some black sheep who are using, misusing the situation. Nevertheless, this is a great possibility for move forward in a positive way. So we have a, a political question. Uh, there's a liberal government currently in office since December in Argentina, and sometimes it seems that everything's about the, the market, the free market and competition, but H2H and IMC put the person and collaboration at the center. Do you see any contradiction or tension between marketing and some political views? Well, there is no doubt about it that the political environment is important for any kind of marketing activities. 
Um, in the age to age concept, we have uh, no political statement in there, but we prefer common goods, which are very important in this kind of situation. And uh, of course, we need a political framework for this. Yeah, and I would add that the ambitions of much of the political class, I guess I would call them, are not consistent with what marketing is doing in terms of serving consumers. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of self-interest that governments have to advance their own agendas that would serve some people but clash with a lot of other people, and that's why you get these tremendous political conflicts and discrepancies between marketing, which is not politically oriented, um, and it's focused on the consumers and the consumer experience. We have a question here about the challenge of generating omni-channel strategies, uh, considering the fact that the same generation behaves differently in different countries in terms of digital adoption. Um, so how would you address that, that conflict of generating a personalized strategy focused on, on CX, considering these difficulties? Yeah, that's a very big challenge. That's a great question. Um, you know, there's this whole long-term trend toward globalization and maybe some sort of standard, especially a lot of companies want to have some standardization in how they go to market to different parts of the world. But different parts of the world are very different in the stages of evolution of technology, of economic development, as we've talked about a little, a little bit ago. Um, and so it becomes very different to do omni-channel and multi-channel and integrated brand communications in in, in different, different markets, markets where, where the markets, markets are so different from each other. So, so, so it, it, it is a matter of really understanding the communications, communications infrastructure and the way that people use communication, communication technologies, technologies and then cater to those, those practices in developing country-specific or region-specific communication uh, structures. I agree on that very much. In addition, we have also the trend of deglobalization. Uh, certain areas are actually uh, cutting them off. I mean, we just have the cutoff of Russia. Uh, we have a very specific Chinese Great Wall who's protecting large markets. Uh, we have uh, developments in Africa which are going their own way. So if companies want to be in this market, they have to act according to the requirements of that situation. Therefore, um, they need to understand, they need to listen, and they need to serve the client in their environment uh, and also the, the political environment. We have time for just one final question here. Um, can we, is it reasonable to interpret that H2H uh, as a vision is a consequence of the new technologies that were applied to one-to-one -one marketing and interactive communications in the 1980s? That is a great hypothesis. I didn't never think about that from that perspective, but um, um, you're right, the technology um, actually is the prerequisite for the changes and therefore technology gave the way. I assume we could have done it without uh, the high digitalization what we have currently, but it really paved the way for the things what we can do now. So we can get actually closer to the individual customer, understand him. Of course, we have to see his own rights and his own wills as an important part of uh, the procedure. But um, I think that's a good judgment that technology paved the way. Yeah, and I would very much agree with that. And the technology is enabling. The technology keeps changing, and it actually keeps getting better if it's used the right way. And uh, I think the convergence of enhanced technologies and enhanced abilities to interact with consumers, both individuals and groups, but also in an ongoing way, leads to a more humanistic experience for consumers. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, although we are out of time right now, I do encourage everyone listening to keep sending in the questions to the email at the bottom of the screen, which will uh, send over to, to our speakers and they'll answer eventually. So 
We now continue by bringing this conversation to Latin America. I have the pleasure of introducing Carlos Treyes, who is CEO of Axon Latam, a digital marketing and public relations agency who traveled all the way from Miami to be at this event. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you very much to Marcela and Reinaldo for this invitation. Um, yeah, I have a very important mission today, but we are talking about Latin America. Uh, sorry, my friends, my colleagues, we translate to Spanish. Gracias uh, por la invitación. Eh, mi nombre es Carlos Treyes. Soy CEO responsable de las operaciones de Axon Marketing and Communication. Muchas gracias. Somos una agencia de comunicaciones integradas de marketing que, como decimos en la oficina, no es otra cosa que entender el negocio del cliente y a partir de ahí poderle ayudar a vender más, a que lo conozcan más, a que sepa lo que tiene que hacer. ¿Sí? El día de hoy tengo una misión bastante importante porque me toca desarrollar unos conceptos con personas bastante más expertas que yo en la parte teórica. Hablar de Latin America, que es una plaza bastante complicada, y adicionalmente hacerlo todo en 15 minutos, así que espero tener mi mejor esfuerzo. <risa> ¿Qué es importante al concepto? Y no, no solamente quisiera con ustedes esbozar algunas ideas o algunos temas que cuando hablamos de H2H marketing o human to human marketing o con lo que queramos llamar, te, se nos vienen a la mente. Creemos nosotros que la parte más importante que tenemos que, que, que estructurar es que estamos hablando de un nuevo modelo de negocio, de un nuevo paradigma, de algo que realmente las marcas antes no acostumbraban. Las marcas no eran so que cálidas, sólidas, amigables. Eran, como decimos en Argentina, cancheras. ¿no? Yo te digo lo que tú tienes que hacer, lo que vos tenés que hacer. Bueno, cuando yo estudiaba en La Plata, porque tuve la suerte de vivir en La Plata, eh, soy de estudiantes, todos tenemos defectos. <risa> eh, eh, las marcas éramos más cancheras y entendíamos ese tipo de cosas. Y hoy lo que tenemos o lo que, nos, lo que se nos exige en el mercado es que para acercarnos a nuestros stakeholders eh, seamos mucho más amigables, mucho más personas. En una u otra forma que después de toda esta pandemia, de todo lo que hemos pasado, recuperemos esa sensación de estar hablando uno a uno de persona a persona. No es más un B2B, no es más un B2C, básicamente somos dos personas, entre comillas, que interactuamos y nos conectamos. Y es definitivamente resultado de todo lo que hemos visto en cuanto a e-commerce, eh, internet, redes, etc. Entonces, el protagonista sencillamente es el cliente. Tú llámalo cliente, tú llámalo usuario, colaborador, amigo, potente, pero es la persona que recibe o que tú necesitas seducir para que conecte contigo, para que te compre, para que apueste por ti para que te dé el día a día. Si nosotros perdemos esa sensación que al frente tenemos una persona, un ser humano, que hoy ah, vino en subte, no durmió, que es padre de familia, que tiene uno, cinco, seis o siete hijos, o que no sabe qué hacer porque se le ocurrió la grandiosa idea de tener un perro en casa y lo quiere matar a la esposa, es súper importante. Si nosotros perdemos eso, dicen los colombianos, que tuve la suerte también de vivir en ese, en ese hermoso país, no hay tutú que valga. Muy importante. Entonces, esto nos plantea a nosotros cinco retos fundamentales, que no son si meto inteligencia artificial, eh, si compro BI o compro la otra solución de Soho. Son temas importantes, pero que marcarán la pauta de lo que yo voy a hacer. Ojo, no estamos diciendo que no necesitamos de la tecnología. Lo que estamos diciendo es que tenemos que dar un paso previo anterior para entender claramente a quién tengo al frente. Porque me va a pedir que sea humano, es decir, yo me equivoco, yo no me las sé todas. Yo intento contigo hacer algo juntos. Te entiendo, conecto con tus temores, con, tus, eh, con, tu, con lo que tú quieres hacer. Segundo, que seamos trascendentes. Y trascendentes, claramente, el mercado no quiere tu tasa de rentabilidad. Esa es una realidad. Es como tú y yo juntos podemos hacer un proyecto superior. Y juntos exploramos qué es superior que eso de ahí puede ser debatible. Para algunos superior es reforestar el Cerro Champaquí, para otros superior es eh, la integración vida-trabajo, para otros superior es eh, 
incrementar cuotas de rentabilidad, pero importante es ese tema. Yo tengo que trascender en un proyecto conjunto, me involucro marca y usuario, marca y cliente, compañía y cliente, tenemos un proyecto común y eso es lo que me da sintonía. El tercero es generar una comunidad, ¿no? que creo que todos conocemos el famosísimo caso de Apple, no sé cuánto, pero hoy todos son Apple, los que usan Patagonia, ¿no? los que corren con las Nike, los que salen con las con las moto Harley, los que salen a trotar temprano, los que hacen cicla, todos quieren una comunidad, todos ponen en común sus intereses y lo que yo tengo que hacer. Entonces, a mí como marcas es un reto. Yo, no estoy, yo estoy acostumbrado a vender champú, chocolate, galletas, este, consultoría, no estoy acostumbrado a crear una comunidad. Entonces, nosotros, los responsables del marketing y la comunicación, tenemos que lograrlo, tenemos que buscarlo, y en un mercado como América Latina que se, se la guarda para luego, ¿no? Cuatro, nuestra capacidad de, de generar emociones, que creo que todos lo sabemos. Y la gente no, no, no digamos que llore, pero dice, oye, esto sí me pasa, eh, es lo que me gusta. Nuestra comunicación está regular tres cuartos. Yo tengo que emocionar antes que convencer. Tengo que emocionar antes que persuadir. Y luego viene un debate ya de si soy mejor o peor. Si no, no, no rompo esa barrera, porque la gente se mamó, como dicen, se cansó de que lo abunde de argumentos racionales, porcentajes. Quiere verte realmente si tú en el llano te pareces a él. Y finalmente, la transparencia. No vale más los aquí, no, no, eso no lo contamos, acá no lo decimos. O sea, si yo no abro mi casa, no va a haber nada. Si yo no desarrollo los canales necesarios, y en esto el concepto famoso de omnicanalidad no sirve para mantener una relación estable donde tú me preguntas desde cuánto pesan las galletas, si tengo grasa o no, o si yo de verdad ayudé a las madres pobres de, del barrio X o Y. Es súper importante la transparencia en las marcas y tenemos que preocuparnos por esa transparencia. Finalmente, lo que nosotros creemos y es importante, juntando todos estos temas, es que si las empresas no tenemos un propósito Estamos en nada. Estamos realmente en nada. Y luego se viene otro reto más importante para quienes estamos aquí que hacemos marketing y comunicación. Es, además, me toca saber comunicarlo. ¿Y por qué el problema se eleva al cuadrado? Porque hoy lo que nos sobran son canales, señores. Y eso es un reto muy importante porque tenemos que hacer primar la eficiencia más allá de la tendencia. Que no significa que me rehúse al cambio. Significa que tengo una firme convicción que tomaré y asimilaré los cambios que impacten de una manera más positiva en el desarrollo de mi marca. Y que me impacten significa que yo tengo que tener el punche financiero, intelectual y de talento para afrontarlo. Creo que todos conocemos el famoso chiste de los clientes, que todos quieren tener Twitter. Ah, pero había que actualizarlo. Claro. Todos quieren inteligencia artificial, pero, ah, eso hay que pagarlo. Claro. ¿Mm? Entonces, es importante ese tema que tengamos en cuenta. Y este es nuestro rol. Quienes estamos aquí, hay uno que estamos medio ya saliendo, otros que todavía están arrancando. Tenemos este gran reto que funciona mucho, aunque a mi director para, para Sudamérica no le gusta mucho esta comparación que hago yo, como las apuestas, ¿no? ¿Dónde va la guita? Eh, ya. Y a los seis meses va a venir tu CEO y te va a decir, ¿y cómo nos fue con tus apuestas? Vendemos más, enganchamos más. Realmente la marca nos asocian con estos conceptos. Súper importante, la eficiencia más allá de la tendencia. Pero la pregunta, y vamos llegando al cierre, que espero lo haga en el tiempo adecuado. ¿Qué pasa en América Latina? ¿Qué es lo que vemos nosotros en nuestros mercados, donde trabajamos hace 18 años con 11 operaciones propias en Estados Unidos y América Latina? ¿Qué nos está pasando? Y que la primera pregunta que dicen, no, está muy bonito eso, pero para Finlandia, para Moscú, para... Eh, porque acá nosotros tenemos una visión un poco negativa de la realidad. Y que realmente es completamente entendible, porque unos tienen inflación, otros tienen renta e inestabilidad política, los otros tienen conflicto, los otros no saben a quién van a elegir porque dicen que es un superpoderoso. Se dice el milagro, pero no el santo, ¿vieron? <risa> y eso es lo que dice el último estudio de Bloomberg. Como dirían ustedes, che, la gente negativa total. 
Solo el 30% de los CEOs sienten que están preparados para asumir los retos que trae el mercado y donde el principal reto que identifican, curiosamente, no tiene nada que ver con ellos. Es inestabilidad política, inestabilidad económica, todos son retos externos cuando se hace el famoso antiguo foro. Pero dicen que en las grandes batallas se conocen a los grandes generales. Los pequeños cambios que nosotros, como CEOs, responsables de las marcas o de las estrategias de comunicación y marketing, podamos hacer, se van a ver bien. Es un ejemplo sencillo, que no es enteramente absoluto, que muestra esa preocupación por cómo conectarme yo con el otro ser humano. Hoy hay un gran tema de debate, la sostenibilidad. El 69% de los CEOs, según una encuesta de KPMG, de la de las empresas en América Latina, ya insertan el tema de la sostenibilidad en su debate. Más del 50% se preocupa por el ecosistema que están insertos. El, el 35% todavía tiene, siente que el tema del componente social le falta por trabajar, pero de una u otra forma existe ya una preocupación. Entonces, los pequeños pasos empiezan a generar grandes cambios. Esto es un efecto en bloque. Si nadie empieza a caminar, va a ser muy complicado. Y yo traía para acá algunos casos que me parecen interesantes de cómo descubrir el propósito, conectar con el propósito, saber para qué vengo yo, es importante. Decían los amigos de Western Union, con los que trabajamos muchísimos años, dicen, yo no mando plata, yo hago posibles proyectos, yo hago posibles sentimientos, yo alegro la vida de las personas en este tema. Y les hay un caso interesante de propósito. La compañía multinacional, o se la conocen Soho Corporation, es una empresa india, cuando apuesta por su expansión en el mundo, dice, yo le voy a apostar a un concepto sencillo, que no es, oye, software en la nube, una solución de office as, que es capaz de administrar una oficina, no. Es, yo quiero ser una empresa que le apuesta a lo que ellos llaman el localismo transnacional, que no es otra cosa que enfocarme en desarrollar mis operaciones en aquellas ciudades o en aquellas plazas en las cuales normalmente no hay trabajo. Entonces, mi headquarters para América Latina no queda en Ciudad de México, sino en Querétaro. Mi headquarters para Colombia y toda la parte del norte no queda en Bogotá, sino en Zipaquirá, que es un valle con un efecto multiplicador de trabajo, bienestar, que la gente dice, yo apuesto por ti. 100 millones de usuarios, 35% de crecimiento sostenido en América Latina. Esas son cosas y son detalles que muestran cómo propósito, comunicarlo, se conecta. Eso es marketing H2A. Yo pienso que al otro lado no tengo un consumidor de software. Pienso que al otro lado tengo una sociedad cuyas preocupaciones son seguir trabajando en la mejora de la calidad de vida de sus personas, de, de su gente. El segundo, este es un clásico. Ni, eh, hemos hecho una selección de casitos, nada personal, aquí no hay... La gente de Latam, unos los odian, unos los quieren, otros dicen que no, que sí, que sea. La realidad, ¿cuál es? Latam y todas las líneas aéreas están haciendo una apuesta muy grande por mostrarse más amigables, más humanas, y su apuesta es, quiero ser más sostenible, quiero cuidar el planeta. Con fuertes inversiones en cuanto a los insumos que utilizan, los aviones que utilizan. Y la pregunta siempre que tenemos en marketing es, oye, con toda esta plata que tú me pides, ¿vamos a vender más? Parece ser que la gente sí. Utilidad de 85 millones de dólares, si no me equivoco, porque no son pesos. Eh, per, eh, 582 millones demuestran que de una u otra forma esa preocupación por el ambiente a veces hace que los usuarios y la cantidad de etiquetas privilegien ciertas comodidades que uno dice, no, es que no me dan esto, no me dan lo otro. La realidad es que los números te van acompañando. Pero vayamos yendo eh, y vayamos llegando más acá, más al sur, más austral. Conocimos el caso de una, funda, de una compañía, Tantal, extremadamente conectada con la Fundación Sembradores de Agua, que tiene un proyecto muy sencillo, reforestar el champaquí. Pero no se trata solamente de que yo te doy la plata y tú reforestas. No, hacemos brigadas juntos, trabajamos juntos, el pueblo, la fundación y los empleados, y hacemos que nuestros empleados participen activamente en la recuperación del cerro. Es un tema interesante porque vuestra esa preocupación que yo puedo tener, porque al final lo que yo vendo son piezas de tungsteno. Y finalmente, no hay que irse muy lejos. Creo que todos conocen el caso de Confíe, eh, Centro de Conciliación Familia y Empresa, 
que apueste donde durante más de 120, durante más de estos 10 años, más de 120 empresas han apostado por cosas que le preocupan a la gente. La responsabilidad social familiar, el liderazgo femenino, si trabajamos en la casa o trabajamos en la oficina, ¿sí? la paternidad, qué hay que hacer con las nuevas generaciones. Finalmente, lo que nosotros tenemos y lo que nosotros tenemos que ver cuando hacemos el tema de Age to Age Marketing, ¿cuál es mi propósito? Recuerden. ¿Qué propósito tengo yo como compañía? Y luego a partir de ahí, integrarlo a todo el abanico de oportunidades de comunicación que yo tengo sin perder mi norte, aunque estemos en la austral. <risa> ¿Cuál es mi norte? Mi norte es al otro lado, yo tengo una persona muy parecida a mí. Muchas gracias. We now have the presentation from Rosario. Now we will solve the problem with the mic. Just in a moment, we will solve the problem with the mic from Rosario. Gracias. Hola a todos. Eh, bueno, le vamos a hacer a Luciano algunas preguntas eh, según su experiencia y su visión. Eh, y la primera es, ¿cómo crees que este modelo Age to Age puede modificar el enfoque tradicional de consumo masivo en la Argentina? Bueno, muchas gracias por, por dejarme estar acá. Eh, a mí me toca... Hablar ahora desde lo más, más práctico, eh, habiendo escuchado a, a, a la base teórica, de lo más práctico de lo local, ¿no? en este caso de empresa de consumo masivo, alimenticia local. Y en realidad, eh, yo reflexionaba un poco, el concepto no cambia tanto. ¿no? Los que trabajamos en marketing siempre pusimos al consumidor en el centro, siempre fue el consumidor el centro de todas nuestras decisiones y nuestras propuestas de valor. ¿no? Lo que ahora nos dicen es, no solamente mires al consumidor como un comprador de tu bien, sino mira a la persona detrás del comprador, mira a la persona detrás de ese consumidor. ¿no? Entonces, eh, sigue poniendo al, 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 al comprador en el centro, pero esta vez como persona. Y esto nos obliga a atender eh, la situación de corto plazo de, de la decisión de compra, sino... Buscar un beneficio duradero con esa persona y conocer más en profundidad a esa persona que está atrás de la persona que compra, ¿no? del, o del comprador. Entonces, eh, que es una persona que está digitalizada, que conversa con otros, que tiene su círculo de confianza, y que construye propuestas de valor alrededor de la marca y la categoría al mismo tiempo que las marcas. ¿no? Entonces es un co-creador de propuesta de valor. Realmente el concepto, si bien es el mismo, es mucho más profundo y realista de la situación completa de la, de la venta a largo plazo. ¿no? Eh, y esto hace, por supuesto, también con, con todo lo que agregan de la lógica del servicio, ¿no? que en, en su momento cuando estudiábamos las primeras ediciones de Kotler hablábamos de producto ampliado, ¿no? ahora es la experiencia, ¿no? pero que más o menos el concepto es, es similar, pero es todavía mucho más profundo, porque es la experiencia y el acompañamiento de la marca en todo el proceso hasta cuando él defiende mi marca o critica mi marca una vez que la ha consumido. Eh, ese es básicamente me parece que el, eh, el aporte. Ahora, cuando pensamos en, en, en este caso en empresas de consumo masivo, de alimentación, y hablamos de la persona, tengo que empezar a pensar qué otras cosas le están afectando a esa persona al momento de comprar. En este caso, que nosotros vendemos alimentos, eh, eh, no puedo dejar de pensar en, en la tendencia de la alimentación saludable. Hoy, más allá de cualquier producto que yo venda, el consumidor o la persona atrás de ese consumidor está preocupadísimo por su alimentación, no solamente por lo que está comprando en mi producto, sino cómo eso se complementa con las otras o los otros alimentos que va a consumir durante el día, ¿no? la conciencia de la alimentación. Entonces, bueno, ¿cómo yo puedo aportar en ese proceso o en esa preocupación eh, que tiene ese consumidor? Por otro lado también, el, la sustentabilidad es otra cosa que también 
les preocupa a todos, ¿no? La huella ecológica, los desperdicios de los envases, eh, los desperdicios de alimentos. Entonces, ¿cómo yo, desde mi propuesta de valor, tengo que tener en cuenta esas otras preocupaciones más humanas del consumidor, más allá del acto de compra de mi propio producto? Y esto lo hacemos en un país como Argentina, ¿no? Que en este caso estamos hablando de una población que tiene más del 50% bajo la línea de pobreza. Entonces, ¿qué le está pasando a esa persona? ¿no? ¿Cuáles son sus preocupaciones? ¿Cuáles son las incertidumbres que tiene respecto al futuro? Entonces, yo no puedo estar ajeno al momento de diseñar propuestas de valor de todas esas situaciones que afectan, en este caso, a la persona. ¿no? Algunos dicen que la Argentina está compuesta, son varias argentinas y hay varias, varios perfiles de personas en, en la Argentina para los que tenemos que venderle a toda la pirámide de consumo masivo. Es realmente un desafío entender a esas personas que son tan distintas aunque seamos todos argentinos. ¿Pensás que puede tener una empresa local ventajas a la hora de tratar de implementar estos nuevos conceptos? Mira, yo creo, creo que sí. Me parece, viste que siempre dicen que hay una oportunidad por toda la problemática. Pero efectivamente sí, digamos, el, el conocimiento local, justamente cuando hablamos ahora ya no de un consumidor que probablemente no está consumiendo un determinado producto, sea similar en todos los países en el acto de consumo. Pero le agrega una complejidad adicional del conocimiento de las personas, ¿no? Y el conocimiento de las personas, estando en la localidad, te conozco más si, si, si vivo cosas parecidas a lo que te pasan a vos. ¿no? Entonces, eso yo sí creo que es una ventaja que podamos tener las empresas locales en el conocimiento de esa persona, ya no el consumidor, sino la persona que está atrás de esa, de esa compra. ¿no? Y también pienso, en, por ejemplo, en la combinación de las tendencias. Nosotros hablamos de sustentabilidad, de alimentación saludable, pero eso yo tengo que insertar en una persona que el 50% de la población es pobre. Entonces, ¿cómo hago para adaptar esas tendencias que son globales, pero que después el consumidor actúa local? O sea, hoy los estímulos los tenemos todos, son, todos tenemos esos estímulos globales, pero después la actuación o el acto de compra es local. Entonces, ¿cómo puedo yo relacionar esos conceptos globales y traducirlos a propuestas de valor concretas que tengan que ver con lo que el consumidor argentino está buscando, que en este caso es la racionalidad, la conveniencia, el foco en el precio? Entonces, combinar, combinar todo eso, todo eso eh, es muy relevante. relevante. Y por otro por lado, lado, los que, que hacemos hace marketing, marketing hace mucho en Argentina, Argentina eh, estamos, estamos acostumbrados, acostumbrados a, a, a... Por suerte, suerte las 4 P son bastante amplias, amplias ¿no? y tenemos algunas, algunas P que son más de corto plazo y, y, y estamos ciclos y años trabajando enfocados en el precio, en la accesibilidad y en la exhibición y en la oferta, y ese es nuestro foco. Y después hemos pasado por otros ciclos que tienen que ver con la construcción de valor, con la comunicación, con el vínculo emocional con el consumidor, con la innovación, el desarrollo de productos. Entonces, por suerte estamos en una profesión que nos permite actuar pendularmente según los ciclos de, de argentinos, en este caso, en diferentes variables. ¿no? Y eso la verdad que creo que es una ventaja respecto a, a, otros, a otros países, ¿no? para forzar una ventaja. Bueno, siempre hablamos de la dinámica del marketing ¿no? y de esta actividad. Y, y siempre estamos frente a nuevos desafíos. ¿Cuáles pensás para tratar de cumplir con el horario que nos han asignado, que vamos muy bien, eh, que son los, los nuevos desafíos que plantea este enfoque? Bueno, eh, la materia prima del marketing es la investigación del mercado, ¿no? es, es el consumidor. Todas las decisiones de marketing están eh, fundamentadas en información del consumidor. Ahora ya nos dicen, no es más el consumidor, es la persona. Entonces, me parece que un gran desafío para la industria de la investigación del mercado es entender a, ese, a esa persona. ¿no? Eh, me pregunto si, si las técnicas tradicionales de investigación del mercado son, siguen siendo válidas o son suficientes, no digo que no lo sean, pero si un focus group o si, o si una encuesta me va a dar... Eh, una, un conocimiento acabado de, de esa persona, no solamente en cuanto a comprador de mi producto, sino en lo que puede incluso hacer en redes sociales. ¿no? Esto ha cambiado totalmente la forma de comunicar. ¿no? Hoy el consumidor eh, comunica mi producto a partir de su propia experiencia. Entonces, eh, ¿cuál, ¿cómo va a ser ese consumidor en cuanto a comunicador? Es algo que, que hasta acá no nos venimos preguntando. Investigábamos al consumidor en cuanto a comprador, pero ahora él co-crea co con nosotros una propuesta de valor. Entonces, ¿cuál va a ser su capacidad? Lo que me dicen un focus group es lo mismo que va a publicar en redes sociales, es lo mismo que va a, 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 a compartir en comunidad, en su comunidad. 
Entonces, eh, me parece que, que la investigación de mercado es algo que, que, que tiene que acompañar esta tendencia y entender este perfil más 360 de, de la persona. ¿no? Y junto con eso, la comunicación. Claramente la comunicación en los últimos 20 años ha tenido, hablo de consumo masivo, ha tenido una transformación enorme. ¿no? Eh, la verdad que de pasar de esas grandes agencias de publicidad con esos grandes avisos eh, de televisión de 45 segundos que eran unidireccionales y que generaban inmediatamente una gran cobertura y una única opinión, bueno, esto ha cambiado rotundamente. Entonces, eh, empezar a pensar que la comunicación tiene que ver con la satisfacción que tiene el consumidor sobre ese producto, la satisfacción genuina que tiene el consumidor con ese producto y cómo lo transmite a su círculo de influencia, que ellos le llaman las jefes, son family, friends, followers, digamos, todo lo que tiene que ver con la comunidad ya social o de redes sociales alrededor de ese consumidor. Entonces creo que... Sin duda la, 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 la industria de la, de la publicidad también tiene que acompañar todo esto y entender que la comunicación ya no es más de uno hacia todos, sino que es de uno a uno, y ese uno también viraliza, genera conceptos, genera contenido. Entonces, ¿cómo puedo hacer para generar contenido, para que el consumidor genere contenido alrededor de mi marca y que ese sea positivo? O sea que son varios los cambios. Por otro lado, la digitalización, ¿no? que también mencionan, Hoy todos dejamos una huella digital. Todo lo que estamos acá, de alguna forma u otra, se sabe que estamos acá. ¿no? Todo lo que realmente lo que compramos, sino eh, cada cuánto compramos, dónde compramos, eso era normal antes, pero ahora también lo que opinamos, lo que opinamos sobre cuestiones más separadas de consumo, sino que tienen que ver con la, hasta con la política, con lo social, con nuestras posturas en la vida, nuestros ideales, todo eso, hoy está. Ese dato está. Entonces empieza a aparecer... La, la, administración la administración del dato, del dato como algo realmente diferenciado. ¿no? Y creo que en, en las áreas de marketing tenemos que empezar a incorporar al dato, ¿no? o sea, procesar esa, esa, toda esa gran información que hoy está. ¿no? Eh, esto demanda, por un lado, no solamente una capacidad técnica de los analistas de marketing, que creo que tienen que incorporar, es una habilidad que tienen que incorporar, saber ordenar los datos, procesarlos, descartarlos que no son relevantes, y procesar todo lo que es bueno, la ciencia de datos, BI, etc. Pero no solamente tenemos que tener una capacidad técnica de, de administrar el dato, sino también los que deciden, los líderes, tienen que tener una cultura de datos, ¿no? porque tienen que saber hacerse las preguntas que los datos van a poder responder. ¿no? O sea, no solamente tengo que tener mineros que sepan trabajar con los datos, sino tengo que generar las preguntas adecuadas que están las respuestas ahí. ¿no? O sea, descubrir a partir de los datos las respuestas para diseñar propuestas de valor. La verdad que creo que ahí, por ahí vienen los grandes desafíos. También esto genera una, una rapidez en los cambios que hasta acá no habíamos visto. Yo soy testigo de, de, de cambios rotundos en mercados maduros, estables y grandes, que se han dado que nunca pasaba nada y en muy poco tiempo han habido transformaciones enormes. ¿no? Eh, mercados que han, han declinado abruptamente y han nacido segmentos y, se, y, y nuevas propuestas de valor diferentes eh, sobre una categoría que parecía madura. ¿no? Entonces, y esto sucede también con la catalización que genera la digitalización, porque los consumidores generan opiniones, comparten, comparten experiencias, provocan cambios. Entonces, tenemos... Los que estamos en las empresas necesitamos una agilidad inusitada. ¿no? Hasta acá trabajábamos un poco por procesos y ahora tenemos que trabajar atrás del resultado, atrás del objetivo, ¿no? empezando con esta idea del, del, eh, del, del mínimo producto viable. ¿no? Ten, tenemos que avanzar con lo que tenemos, pero hay que avanzar. ¿no? Y por último, ya me imagino que estamos pasándonos probablemente, pero... Me parece que lo que más nos, me deja a mí por lo menos pensando, y los invito a ustedes también, creo que durante mucho tiempo, eh, no sé si hemos hecho bien o mal las cosas, pero me parece que está buena una, una autocrítica de la, de, de, la, de la profesión del marketing. ¿no? Es decir, eh, no podemos negar que el consumidor cada vez cree menos en las marcas. Cada vez cree menos en lo que dicen las marcas. Cree en lo que dicen sus amigos, en lo que dice su familia, en lo que dice hasta los, sus influencers pero no a las marcas. Entonces, ¿por qué pasa esto? No? Creo que bueno, durante mucho tiempo 
puede ser que mucha gente haya hecho un mal uso del marketing o haya hecho una, una sobrepromesa muchas veces de atributos que después no eran verificados al momento de, del consumo. Hemos, hemos visto ejemplos en consumo masivo con enormes promesas, hasta del cuidado de salud. Y, a la, y, bueno, y después eso tiene que suceder. ¿no? Entonces, me parece que esto nos invita a a ser más genuinos, a ser más eh, honestos profesionalmente, reivindicar la profesión del marketing para generar propuestas honestas, propuestas dignas de que efectivamente se cumplan en, en el consumidor. ¿no? Esto, cuando hablamos de, de age to age, hablamos de personas y, y, y lo que une a las personas es la confianza. ¿no? Entonces, generar esas bases de confianza desde la marca hacia la persona, dándole satisfactores concretos, reales, a largo plazo, de sus, de sus problemas, de sus preocupaciones, y por el otro lado, que el consumidor pueda depositar en nosotros esa garantía de satisfacción que tanto buscamos para que recompre, para que vuelva a nosotros. ¿no? O sea, creo que también es un llamado hacia, hacia la profesión y hacia, y hacia, en definitiva, hacer un poco más, trabajar un poco más sobre el largo plazo y sobre la, la sustentabilidad de, del beneficio del consumidor. Bien, bueno, tenemos que decir que Luciano es graduado de esta facultad. Parece que ayer estaba en estas aulas. Pero fue hace bastante. No, parece que era antes de ayer porque el hijo ya ingresó este año. Así que gracias. No me quemes, como dice. <ríe> gracias, Luciano. Bueno, no sé cómo se hace. Vamos a estudios centrales claro, o no sé. sé. ¿Eh? Gracias, Luciano Alejandro. Continuamos ahora con Francisco Aldaya desde Buenos Aires. So our seminar now turns to a very promising area of development in marketing, which is closely linked to a humanistic perspective, marketing and its relation with education and sciences. For this purpose, Austral University has invited Professor Alan Oliveira, head of education at um, the education department, sorry, at State University of New York, Albany, who is spending a few days here at Austral working uh, from Argentina. Hi everyone, uh, great to be here. Uh, let me see if I figure out my slideshow real quick. Social entrepreneurship. Thank you so much. So yes, I'm, I'm joining the discussion today from a kind of a, a, a different uh, perspective, specifically from STEM, science, technology, uh, mathematics, and engineering. And uh, my research has, has been focused mainly on how to make the training of uh, future scientists better. And one of the ways that we've been trying to do this is integration of other disciplines. And that's where, that's why I'm here today. So one of the ways that we've been exploring uh, this uh, integration is to integrate business and marketing into STEM to provide the, our future scientists with training in this area. Uh, so this is what, what I'm going to be talking here about today. So uh, as a science educator talking primarily to science educators, uh, I have to usually start by arguing for entrepreneurship. You know, why should future scientists learn a little bit, little bit about entrepreneurship? And uh, so I usually have to make the, the traditional arguments. That's important for economy. It can lead to, you know, any scientific discovery can, can lead to technological innovation. You know, that leads to com commercialization and therefore economic growth and welfare to any society. Uh, so that's typically the argument that I make. Uh, also, uh, what's interesting for those of you who are not familiar with what's going on in STEM these days, there has been quite a few calls recently to, for the integration of entrepreneurship. This book has been 
the first of its kind, has been just published, Enhancing Entrepreneurial Mindsets Through STEM Education. Uh, so here, the idea is that future scientists need to be able to, uh, to experience this process of, of technology com commercialization, going from ideation to implementation of a, a business plan. Uh, they should uh, experience uh, the pursuit of profit from science. That's kind of a problematic call, but has been made. You know, the students should be able to experience how to profit from science. Uh, I'll, I'll revisit that in a little while. Uh, Students should also be able to, to, to experience how to develop a business and to develop entrepreneurial skills and this mindset of uh, that businessmen and marketeers supposedly have. So, uh, the answer when you look at the, at the literature, that it's not that common yet, I don't think. Marketing, integration of marketing and, and business is it's quite, quite new in STEM. So what we see, though, is that the efforts that do exist tend to be primarily for profit. Honestly, people in STEM don't really know about social entrepreneurship, humanistic perspectives on marketing or anything like that. So typically, when they, they try that integration, they go for profit-oriented types, types of approach, okay? They still have, there's a lot of misconceptions. I think the Professor Miller, I think, talked earlier about this problem of misconceptions of the field. You know, as outsiders, people have lots of misconceptions about what marketing and business is. So the effort to become biased towards a particular view of what the field is. So what we see is sometimes if you're lucky as a STEM student, you, you have an e-commerce e kind of course available to you. Uh, some professors, they, they try pitching activities, competitions, and things like that. So that's the way that they find to uh, allow students to experience business in marketing in undergraduate school. I have not seen anyone do social entrepreneurship or social humanistic marketing of any sort in a STEM classroom. Uh, so, it's uncommon, yet there are a few cases that I'm seeing happening right now. So these are some of the few cases, three cases maybe, that I was able to find by uh, looking at the literature, talking to colleagues. So there are some interesting cases of 3D, 3D printers being used where students have to, to use 3D printers to generate prosthesis, prosthetics for the disabled, for dogs, for, for people with, with disability. And so they create this new product for attending the need, a handicap that someone has. So that's a more humanistic perspective. Uh, there's a case of a smart, uh, students trying to design a smart blind cane with sensors that would transmit information for the blind. Uh, very interesting cases. Uh, wearable trackers for people with, that suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Creating apps for community and social good. Uh, so these are some of the cases that I'm seeing here. So basically what these are, these are altruistic projects that uh, supposedly are effective in engaging students from underrepresented groups. And that's the thing. The absence of social entrepreneurship is it's, it's, uh, it's very important because typically, if you want to attract groups from other, they're underrepresented in, underrepresented in science, to typically, any effort that's aimed at generating profit does not appeal to them. But social entrepreneurship does. So in, in a way, uh, it kind of, they're kind of missing the target, the educators, when they engage students in those kind of activities that are more profit-oriented. Profit so, uh, I know this is hard to see. So the, the research problem in a few words is that we wanted to understand a little bit better the potential of, of integration of business and marketing into, into, uh, it, into STEM. So to this end, we actually conducted an empirical study in Ottawa, Canada, uh, and uh, careful. Uh, and also, uh, it was in the biology department, 40 students and undergrad undergraduate class is actually quite similar in format to this. And so the students had never had any class or any preparation in marketing or anything at all. Okay, they're bi biology majors. So we created a challenge for them in which they had to uh, pitch this new, a new product called Hungry Planet so up at the top there. It's actually a new product, it does exist. It's a plant-based meat product and uh, I don't know how much you know about this, but this is one of the, 
the ways that we can help address climate change. I don't know if you've ever seen the, some of the research in this area, but uh, when you raise cattle, cattle takes a lot of space. So you have to, to clear more forest to make room for the cattle to be raised. So the more eat we consume, the more meat we consume, the more CO emis CO2 emissions we, we have. So that's one of the ways to help with mitigation of climate change is to consume a product like that. And that's one of the reasons why you wanted them to, to, to try to sell that product, to pitch that product, because uh, we wanted them also to learn the science behind it, you know, in the process. And also it's healthy for you too, when you look at the nutritional fact, facts behind this, it's also healthy for you. So there's nutritional benefits as well to this. So they had to research the product, research the science behind it, and make a pitch for launching this product nationwide in Canada, okay? So uh, that was the challenge. So the idea here is that not only do they learn science, but they also get to experience what it feels like to be a businessman, to be a marketeer, for at least for a few minutes. They, they understand, and maybe they're, if we're lucky, they're, they become open to, to the idea that in the future, they might themselves consider uh, some kind of profession uh, where they, they, they become like a, a STEM entrepreneur, a, a science uh, entrepreneur kind of person. So uh, to do this, we actually provided them with some guidance. There was a small lecture, 30 minutes, from a science, environmental scientist who had a back, uh, background in marketing. And uh, so the, the, the lecturer gave them some, they gave them a presentation with, with examples of several different marketing campaigns in Canada. They were very, very successful. Uh, they talked about strategies like the, the need to excite, to empower your audience, to uh, uh, do, do things like uh, experiments, testing a product locally before going nationally, and, and things like that. After that, after that uh, students uh, working in groups of three had to research the product, research the science, and prepare their pitches for the last day. So that's what happened the last day. So that was, it was a very long process. It wasn't just like saying, you know, uh, pitch this product and good luck. We wanted to support them in the process as well. Okay. Uh, so before I, t I, sh I tell you what happened exactly, I, I like to talk up to you a little bit about our perception of entrepreneurship, that uh, we considered entrepreneurship to be something, uh, two, two things, the two dimensions that we felt was very important and that informed our design of this experience. One, we thought of entrepreneurship as a way of thinking, a cognitive way. Uh, so abilities like to be able to recognize a business opportunity. You know, it's a thinking, it's a thinking ability. But we also think of, of, of entrepreneurship in an exercise like pitching as in a cultural way that can shape your identity, who you are, who you think you are. So. It allows students to position themselves, at least for a few seconds, as an entrepreneur, possibly an entrepreneur, okay? And if they like the experience, you know, they might become more open to becoming that entrepreneur in the future. So it's an identity shift that we wanted them to just say, you know, try, you know, it's business is school, marketing school, try it, you know, for at least for a little while, you might like it. So that was the, the agenda behind this, ex behind this exercise. So uh, I'll, I'll go ahead here and, and, and skip to the findings. So students pitched a whole bunch of, of activities, uh, partnerships with uh, different social uh, uh, networks, with uh, Instagram, with uh, YouTube, and also they tried things like free sampling in, in local restaurants, trying to, to get people to try out the product. So that was primarily the, some of the things they, they did. So. Uh, what was interesting, though, it was that, uh, let me see here if I find uh, here, th this is where I want it. So what was interesting, though, despite them uh, experiencing the way of thinking that business people have, a lot of them felt very uncomfortable. Student three, uh, for instance, said that uh, she was not uncomfortable. She felt like the, that new position was uncomfortable, ideally because of the notion of profit. So they felt like we're asking them to become the, the, the very greedy, this kind of a shark stereotype that you usually have for a businessman, and that made them comfortable. For them, being a scientist meant that you're, you do things not for profit. You do things for the, because of the passion of you know, knowing, discovery, sharing knowledge, not for profit. 
So this idea of a profit orientation was problematic for them. Okay, so that made them very uncomfortable. So, uh, so I think even student five here talks about, I've learned that I need to sell, sell science, you know, and, and for them that was very, very uncomfortable, this idea of selling science, that that should not be ha happened. So, uh, so what we found here, because of the lack of attention to social entrepreneurship or a more humanistic perspective, the experience wasn't as, as effective as we thought uh, that we, we hoped for, okay? And uh, so pitching did not really appeal to, to, to many students for the, because of that profit orientation. So therefore, uh, it's something that I think STEM educators need to be, to be uh, educated about. We need to address those misconceptions the professors talked about earlier, misconceptions about the field, and find ways to incorporate more humanistic and social, socially oriented uh, uh, approaches to, uh, to entrepreneurship and allow science students actually to experience that. I think that's really the, 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 the goal here, uh, the main point that I wanted to make. And not to try to, to have your science students just you know, experience that for-profit uh, uh, approach that they felt it makes them feel so uncomfortable. And I'll stop here because of time. Thank you. Jorge, ¿se escucha? Perfecto. Este, fíjate que acabar de mover ahí. Ahí está. ¿Estamos? Estamos. Bueno, con, continuando con las ponencias de hoy, eh, muchísimas gracias Eugenia, Raúl, Francisco, por estar aquí con nosotros. En, en la ponencia que explicaban desde Rosario, nos hablaban de que estamos todos en una bolsa digital, ¿no? Es lo mismo que decir la transformación digital ya es parte de la realidad del mundo de los negocios. Y ustedes como personas responsables de la estrategia o de la ejecución de la estrategia de marketing, un poquito lo que queríamos ver hoy es en la realidad, en las compañías en Argentina o a nivel latinoamericano, esta transformación digital, ¿cuáles han sido los cambios que ha impactado en los últimos años? Bueno, mujeres primero, no, que antiguo, ¿no? El tema de la transformación, es parte de la transformación. Es parte de la transformación, por eso te dejo entonces. Dale, dale, tranquilo. Bueno, eh, hola a todos, gracias Ernesto por la invitación. Y la transformación es constante, ¿no? Y la verdad que llegar al consumidor no es fácil, el desafío es grande. Y tiene que ver mucho con lo que hablaba Carlos antes también, o, o recién Alan, en términos de entrepreneurship y cómo los consumidores también son entrepreneurs y están muy activos en lo que necesitan. Conectar con el propósito es la parte uno. Ellos tienen propósitos en la vida y nuestros productos y marcas tienen que conectar con eso. Segunda transformación es la parte de personalización. Ya lo que es promedio para todos, lo que decimos café para todos, no va más. Y la personalización en escala para que sea eficiente es el segundo cambio que hemos implementado en nuestro caso, en, en nuestra compañía, en el caso Mondeliz. Eh, tercero es confiar, generar que la marca es creíble. Todo lo que decís, más vale que pase, porque lo pueden comprobar y si no, le preguntan a su comunidad, le preguntan a sus influencers, o a sus amigos o familiares. Entonces, primero, personalización. Segundo, la parte de generar confianza y credibilidad con lo que decís y con lo que haces de manera digital. Y manejo de la data de ese propósito para entender a ese consumidor como persona eh, desde el punto de vista de qué le pasa, qué quiere y qué necesita de manera individual. Y hoy hay mucho acceso a mucha data, que la parte analítica para nosotros es uno de los cambios en términos de capacidades y formas de manejarla. ¿no? Eh, principalmente esos tres y los dejo a ellos que sigan complementando. Este, estoy totalmente de acuerdo y me pasó también mientras escuchaba, escuchaba a Carlos y decía, eh, podría trabajar, eh, no sé si está Carlos por acá, pero opino igual que Carlos, hablaba Luciano, opino igual que Luciano y es algo que está bueno porque en definitiva, digo, bueno, evidentemente todos los marketineros estamos en la misma, este, también pueden sacar de acá y poner eh, donde está él eh, o donde está, perdón, Eugenia, perdón. Este, y el propósito nuestro es eh, siempre el mismo. No te voy a negar que es cierto que la transformación, primero creo que la tenemos que tener nosotros, por lo que veo, las edades nuestras creo que son parecidas, 
Y creo que primero tenemos que cambiar nosotros. A mí personalmente me costó un montón, porque también vengo de una escuela donde el director marketing o el uno de marketing era él que sabía todo y el resto acompañaba. Y hoy eso cambió. Yo estoy lejísimo de ser el que más sabe en mi compañía, personalmente en Puma, ¿no? Este, la gente que viene abajo nuestro es mucho más especialista en este tema de digital. Y hoy es, bienvenido sea, y enseñame que quiero aprender lo que vos sabés. Este, y sí o sí tenemos que transformar primero nosotros para ponernos en el lugar. Por eso lo que hablaba Carlos, este, Luciano, es como digo, tal cual, el, el Human to Human también que menciona bastante, o mucho, de hecho es el, el core del libro, este, entender el consumidor. Y a nosotros nos pasa, o pasa bastante, que hay mucho estudio. Este, al menos en Puma tratamos de hacer muchos estudios y no sé si es el día a día, el foco que tiene uno, eh, la velocidad eh, en que transcurre todo, que hay mucha data y poco proceso o poca información o bajada de esa data. Entonces hacemos estudios, ves los primeros outputs que vienen de ahí, pues, bueno, y quedo ahí. Y tengo un estudio de hecho de running, y tengo un estudio de hecho del de comportamiento del consumidor y qué consumen en cuanto a medios. Y el día a día te lleva, te lleva y es donde decís, bueno, pará, hay que frenar un momento para todo esto que tenemos, procesarlo y en función de eso ver qué quiere el consumidor, qué quieren las personas y avanzar. Porque si no, sigue todo igual. Entonces habla mucho de transformación, pero el día a día te come y sigue todo igual. Y es para explayarse un montón, pero seguimos. Porque... A ver, si yo me pongo a pensar el tema del impacto de la digitalización en el lado de Pepsi Bebidas, que es donde hoy me toca trabajar, Creo que me gustaría pensarlo tanto del lado push y del lado pull. Del lado push, nosotros en la pandemia, eh, bueno, obviamente como, como todo el mundo, nos costaba mucho salir a vender nuestros productos. Y en ese momento empezamos con todo un proceso de migración de nuestro sistema de venta tradicional de preventa, en la cual iba una persona, tomaba el pedido, el día siguiente camino lo entregaba, a un nuevo sistema con una plataforma, una app que se llama Biz, en la cual hay un cambio gigante, por ahí es el cambio más grande que estamos teniendo hoy en nuestra compañía en temas de digitalización, que es el punto de venta, ya no se le empoma el producto por alguna manera, sino que el punto de venta pasa a ser como un consumidor que tiene pool. O sea, el punto de venta desde su teléfono, él hace el pedido, entonces eso a nosotros del lado de marketing nos obliga también a tener otra relación con el punto de venta que por ahí antes era mucho más de ese desarrollo material POP, ahora tenemos que hacer toda una batería de cosas que antes no teníamos y a partir de datos y algoritmos es que también llegamos al punto de venta eh, como si fuese un nuevo consumidor que antes no teníamos en el radar. Y es así que es para hacerlo corto el pool de push, pero podría estar tres horas hablando de eso. De lado de pool, bueno, al margen del obvio que es social media, eh, nosotros hoy todo lo que es digitalización y un poco parecido a lo que decía Eugenia de personalization at scale, eh, lo trabajó mucho y especialmente en lo que es eh, marketing deportivo. O sea, Gatorade, que es una de nuestras marcas más grandes, tenemos una, para ahí, la marca más avanzada en lo que es eh, digitalización. Tenemos una base de consumidores gigantes, especialmente acá en Argentina, donde lo que buscamos es casi estar en el real time deportivo y acompañar esa agenda. O sea, para mi equipo es un esfuerzo gigante porque implica estar online casi 24 horas o estar de 9 a 18 en la oficina y después estar atento a lo que pasa si juega a Boca, si juega, no sé, si juegan los Pumas, si hay una carrera, etc. Eso también, esa personalización a escala, es lo que está generando una diferencia gigante en cómo nosotros conectamos con el consumidor. Que antes, por ahí hacíamos la comparación, nosotros hacemos un comercial de 30, 60 segundos y nos enteramos a los mes, mes y medio, cómo había performado. De hecho, justo acá venía un call de una campaña que estamos corriendo que nos van diciendo semana a semana, por, podría ser hasta día por día, cómo performan las piezas y en función de eso, qué vamos entregando. Y el abanico de assets que se te abren para cada campaña. ¿no? De una, una pieza, one, five, one size fits all, a tenemos campañas que llegan a tener hasta 200 o 300 ejecuciones. Y, y en este mundo de la digitalización, los invito a hacer un ejercicio de futurología. Y, digamos, el marketing nos obliga a tener una pata en el pasado, o en el presente y después una en el futuro para tratar de anticiparnos a ese futuro, ¿no? ¿Cómo, cómo imaginan este futuro de las, de las organizaciones en las que ustedes están y las estrategias de marketing con lo que viene? Porque todo esto que hablamos ya tiene tres años, digamos, la pandemia ya prácticamente va a cumplir tres años y dentro de poco va a haber una generación que no va a saber qué es lo que había prepandemia. Entonces, ¿cómo ustedes van anticipando todos estos movimientos tecnológicos y qué impacto imaginan en las organizaciones? 
Sí, el primer impacto es interno, parecido a lo que comentabas, eh, cambiando estructuras, cambiando formas de trabajo, procesos y después perfiles y skills de las personas que trabajamos. Muchos no somos nativos digitales y muchos nos montamos a la ola lo que viene hoy los consumidores del futuro, que son la generación alfa y generación Z, hay muchos por acá, son muy distintos en la rapidez de lo que necesitan, en lo instantáneo de lo que piden para satisfacer esas necesidades que cada vez se abren más en el día a día, sobre todo en nuestro mundo del esnaqueo, que son micro necesidades y micro oportunidades minuto a minuto. Tercero, la forma en que van a comprar. Hoy tenemos nuestra estructura de lo que llamamos root to market o el músculo para llegar a la calle. BIS es una plataforma que se está analizando porque la omnicanalidad es enorme. Antes compraba en un kiosco, un almacén, un autoservicio. Hoy compran online, pero online en Rappi o online en Jumbo. Hoy compran en alguna feria, si hablamos de niveles socioeconómicos más bajos. Eh, hoy tienen un nivel de manejo de información que les permite llegar a los productos que quieren, personalizados como quieren, con el formato que necesitan, en el canal más propio, con la mejor estrategia de precio y promociones. Eso hace que tenemos que estar en todos lados a cada, a cada momento. Un ejemplo rapidito, anecdótico, fuimos la semana pasada a Mendoza, llevamos a todo el equipo regional a la casa de los consumidores, Mendoza, Luján de Cuyo, consumidor de verdad. Eh, todos son de verdad, pero bueno, este era un poco más. Entonces, profundo. Y nos llamó la atención dos cosas. Uno, dispuestos a no sacrificar marca en un contexto de crisis, ¿por qué? Porque no pueden desperdiciar. Entonces, si la marca que compran les gusta a los hijos, perfecto, aunque salga más cara. Si compran más barato y no les gusta, desperdicio no sirve. Y por otro lado, no confían en las promociones de los supermercados. ¿En quién confían? En el chat de mamás del colegio. Que van caminando a la mañana y buscan la mejor oferta del asorio y van todas al chino que está en la esquina para las ofertas de asorio. Confían en una comunidad propia para buscar ofertas. ¿Qué quiero decir con esto? No podemos controlar nada sentaditos en un escritorio. Entonces, la data es importante, ir a la casa de la consumidora es importante, hacer las cosas rápido, pero para eso hay que mover a los elefantes que considero somos en mover una organización atrás de la transformación. La data, estructura, formas de trabajo y los skills de los futuros este, marketineros es crucial. Yo, a ver, a mí me parece también, creo que lo que está pasando ahora con inteligencia artificial es... Es sorprendente, o sea, lo que lanzó OpenAI de Sora, creo que hace, hace un mes, más o menos, o sea, no, no sé, el tiempo pasa muy rápido. Eso va a cambiar, justo tuvimos esta semana también, nosotros, o sea, todo el equipo regional de marketing acá en Buenos Aires, y, y cuando ves lo que viene de AI y cómo nosotros mismos ya estamos, eh, para no sé si a nosotros nos va a cambiar tanto el trabajo, si nos va a cambiar mucho la velocidad, pero hablamos un poco en chiste, un poco en serio, el, el rol de las productoras y las agencias creativas. Hoy, básicamente, Sora o cualquier plataforma de AI, nosotros estamos haciendo una, de estos millones de assets que hacemos, muchos los hacemos con AI, o hacemos el fondo con AI y hacemos un shooting con green screen y le ponemos el consumidor arriba de un fondo de AI. Y eso a nosotros nos da muchísima más velocidad, muchísima más adaptabilidad eh, y nos permite responder más rápido a las demandas del consumidor. O sea, porque, creo que Eugenia también lo decía, si vos no estás ahí, perdiste un consumidor y es como que nosotros sí nos pone mucha presión en términos de equipo estar como todo el tiempo encima del dato para ver qué es lo que el consumidor opina para entregar lo que él quiere. Eh, y entonces hay que estar como muy atento a lo que son estas plataformas y enseguida subirte a eso, aprender y ver cómo sacarle el mayor jugo posible. Sí. <coughs> eh, Adiro, ahí mencionaba Eugenio también el tema del de, eh, ejemplo de las mamis de colegio y demás y hoy y no quiero ponerme en técnico, pero hace poco leía eh, filósofo israelí Kahneman, y perdón si no es israelí, pero me acuerdo, creo que sí, que decía que el 95% de la toma de decisiones, bueno, la teoría de los dos sistemas, ¿no? el 95% de las decisiones son espontáneas y el 5% son los racional. Entonces, yo creo que lo primero que, y esto hablo yo desde Puma puntualmente, tenemos que conseguir con nuestros consumidores es el tema emocional, que la persona... No tanto posicionamiento de marca, porque en cuanto a posicionamiento yo creo que la gente conoce la marca Puma, pero yo hoy lo que necesito, nosotros hoy lo que necesitamos es que el consumidor tenga ese sentido de, eh, ni siquiera de pertenencia, porque pertenencia creo que va mucho más allá todavía y falta un montón. Y hoy de nuevo, los consumidores hay tanta, tanta, tanta información que son muy pocos los leales a las marcas. Más en, mi, en nuestra industria, en mi industria, una persona al gimnasio con una remera Nike, unas zapatillas Adidas y un unisor Puma. Entonces, y está bien, yo lo que tengo que tener hoy es 
meterme en esa cabeza, lo que es mental, ability, mental availability, que es que al menos me tengan cuenta que esa persona a la hora de pensar en una marca deportiva, piensa en Puma. Entonces, para lograr toda la parte digital, que es cierto, que para mí es una herramienta más, lo mismo que los estudios de mercado y demás, son data, y esto es una opinión personal, para mí todos los estudios ayudan a tomar decisiones, no me las toman. El que toma decisiones somos nosotros en función de un montón de cosas. Y la, todo el proceso de información me ayuda muchísimo. El tema digital ayuda un montón, pero yo primero lo que tengo que ver es dónde se mueve el consumidor, cómo le llego, cómo hago que... A ver si realmente lo digital, hoy se habla mucho de digital first, digital first, pero creo que hay un montón de cosas atrás de lo digital que pueden lograr, digamos, este sentido de, 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 de emocionalidad que yo necesito con mi consumidor. Entonces, digital es importantísimo, pero creo que, como todo, hay que saber desde el lado de marketing cómo, cuándo, en qué momento, de qué manera, de qué forma hablar al consumidor. Si es digital, buenísimo. Si no es digital y es vía pública, buenísimo también. El tema es que tienes que estar seguro de que tu mensaje llega, porque como decía Eugenio también, hay 200 millones de marcas. El consumidor recibe información todo el tiempo y hoy ya no le cree a casi nadie. Entonces creo que lo primero es ser creíble en lo que comuniques y segundo es tener al consumidor como principal asset para decir, bueno, ¿qué es lo que, va, qué es lo que quiere escuchar? Y en función a eso, armar la estrategia. Ya la última cortita antes de que nos empiecen a mirar con cara de, de, de que vamos. Eh, estando en Latinoamérica, ustedes forman parte de multinacionales, pero, pero nuestro, nuestro negocio, el negocio de las marcas de ustedes está, está ubicado en Argentina, en Latinoamérica. ¿Cómo estamos en este proceso de digitalización en cuanto al nivel de evolución comparado con otros lugares del mundo? ¿Y cuál sería el, la barrera que hoy está frenando que eso no sea un avance a una velocidad mayor? Eh, ¿Quieren empezar ustedes? Bueno, voy. Eh... Dos partes importantes. Uno es la digitalización de caras a la comunicación para el consumidor. Creo que estamos en niveles parecidos con el mundo porque hemos evolucionado de tener la inversión un 12 a 15% digital hace 5 o 7 años, hoy a niveles de 50% de la inversión puesta atrás de digital. Creo que comunicación estamos más o menos en el buen, en el buen tren, sobre todo con la producción de muchos elementos, personalización at scale y la, y la evolución de la cantidad de inversión. Donde creo que estamos un poco más atrasados es en la parte de digitalización, tanto del punto de venta, tanto del e-commerce, tanto de toda la infraestructura para digitalizar al dueño del almacén. Y eso tiene que ver no por no estar atentos a la tendencia o por un tema de costos o de tecnología, porque eso está disponible, sino porque somos un mercado a diferencia del desarrollado que tiene el 70% del consumo, consumo masivo, no necesariamente en, en ropa, eh, en lo que llamamos tradicional que son los kioscos, almacenes, autoservicios, no los supermercados. Entonces, el mundo tiene al revés la proporción, no tiene tradicionales, 80, 90 supermercadismo, que es mucho más tecnologizado. Entonces, para mí es un tema de estructura del mercado en términos de canales de venta y en esa parte acelerando un montón, eh, pero todavía nos falta. Para nivel consumidor y comunicación creo que bastante bien. Nosotros, apareció la estructura de canales, lo que decía Eugenia, eh, pero sí dentro de lo que es PepsiCo global, Latinoamérica es relativamente importante y dentro de lo que es Latinoamérica, Brasil y Argentina son muy pesados y particularmente Brasil, todo lo que es digitalización está mucho más avanzado que Argentina. La, la aceptación de esta plataforma BIS es gigante, estamos hablando de un país de un millón de puntos de venta y básicamente un millón de puntos de venta compran con esa plataforma porque es un país que la gente está acostumbrada a no usar efectivo eh, y usar su celular. En Argentina nos está costando un poco más, pero estamos en ese camino eh, por las cosas coyunturales de Argentina, uso efectivo, negro, etc. Cuando vamos a la parte de las marcas, eh, creo que también estamos relativamente bastante avanzados. Eh, de nuevo, vuelvo al caso de Gatorade. Por ejemplo, Gatorade acabamos de lanzar esta semana una app que se llama Match Saber, que es, eh, como lo resumimos, una especie de Tinder del deporte, en la cual si vos, no sé, vas a jugar al fútbol y un amigo, no sé, te dejó de garpe y no va a ir a jugar, vos ahí tenés como una bolsa de gente que te puede ir a salvar. O sea, básicamente, en resumidas cuentas es eso. Y, Ar y Argentina es el primer país que lo está haciendo eh, en ese sentido. También en la pandemia lanzamos un bot de entrenamiento de Gatorade que nos fue muy bien en WhatsApp, partiendo el insight de que un montón de gente estaba entrenando, que no tenía guía, que ya no tenía más plata, porque vos, otra app, otra app, otra app, y te ocupa espacio del teléfono. En Latinoamérica, la verdad que los planes eh, de datos, por ejemplo, te bonifican WhatsApp, entonces era virtualmente gratis y a nosotros nos permitía tener otra interacción. Y eso no, no lo había desarrollado nadie. 
Sí donde estamos muy atrasados en la parte de e-commerce. O sea, el e-commerce en Latinoamérica está, vos ves Estados Unidos, está a 3 millones de pasos adelante. Pero bueno, nada, y depende mucho más de, de la coyuntura de nuestros países eh, y donde podemos avanzar, avanzamos. Así que... Yo, un cortito para cerrar. Eh, creo lo mismo en cuanto a comunicación, en cuanto a herramientas, en cuanto a plataformas eh, de comunicación hacia el consumidor, creo que estamos a la altura de cualquier otro país. De hecho, la parte digital nos llega a nosotros como llega a cualquier otro lugar. Y creo que sí nos falta, como decía Eugenia, el tema del, no sé si es lo mío o qué, pero el servicio. Creo que el servicio, tanto en tienda como en e-com, eh, como el día a día, y sin, de nuevo, yendo al punto que lo más importante de todo es el consumidor, y nosotros como marca no podemos permitir que, te hablo de nuevo desde de Puma en sí, el momento que va el consumidor al punto de venta a buscar algo y no está, o voy a cambiarlo, y anécdota bien rapidita, eh, compra de botines de un cliente, se le rompió en vez de los dos meses o tres que es de cambio, a los cuatro. Y tardamos como un mes en, en que sí, que idas y vueltas. Y digo, muchachos, anda, cámbiaselo. Dale el otro botín. No, pero no tiene el ticket. Dale el otro botín. Y ya está. Y esas cosas en otros países donde vas, ah, discúlpame, y ni te preguntan, te lo cambian. Entonces, eso creo que todavía nos falta, el tema del servicio al consumidor. Como dijo Alejandro de Rosario, volvemos a Estudios Centrales y cerramos. Muchísimas gracias por la, por la participación. Thank you for that very interesting panel. We're now approaching the summit of this event, and we're going to wait a few minutes as Professor Philip Kotler, father of modern marketing, sets up uh, his presentation via Zoom. Uh, before that, we'll be hearing a few words from Reinaldo Rivera, uh, who will introduce uh, Professor Kotler. So in the meantime, uh, I invite you all to send in your questions, if you have any, and uh, let's just wait uh, for Philip to uh, get his presentation ready.
Flame, Hey, hello, can you hear me? Thank you, yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, thank you. Ah. Good morning, Professor Kodler. Thank you so much for coming. Well, I'm happy to be here, and I want to, I want to get the idea of sharing my screen. Yes, yeah. you could. Uh, in, a, in a few seconds, they will put off this screen, and you could present your, you could share your screen. One second. No, this is my personal dream, Professor Kotler, to have you. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, I just, I just I did, did the wrong thing. thing. Let me let just see what happened here. here. Okay. <laughs> now let me let me hit this once more. Uh, the share screen is here, and this is the one. Okay. Now what I. I what I want to do is move this uh, closer and bigger. Ah, okay. Okay. If you if you allow me, I would like to introduce you. Although you don't need to be introduced, but just to say hello. I understand. You know, <laughs> because uh, you know, for, for every marketer, especially from Latin America. It's a, it's a dream uh, to have you. Uh, although, well, next time in person, but... <laughs> okay, uh, well, nice, well, nice to, to meet you, you too. too. Nice, nice to meet you. So, I am, I am delighted to introduce Professor Kotler, as I said, he doesn't need to be introduced, but he, he's the father of modern marketing, he's the inspiration for the whole ecosystem we are creating here in Universidad Austral. He's the S.C. Johnson Distinguished Professor of International Marketing at the Kellogg School of Management. He's the author of over 150 articles and 90 books. And besides HOH Marketing 2024, Professor Kotrid is publishing five new books. Redefining Retailing, I am in touch with his co-author, uh, Joseph Estigliano, uh, Transformative Marketing, Humanism in Marketing, Marketing 6.0, The Future is Immersive, and Reimagining uh, Operational Excellence. Thank you, Pro Professor Kotler, from our heart, for your generosity to be with us today. The floor is completely yours. Well, thank you very much. I uh, feel very welcome to uh, Austro University uh, in a country which is one of my favorite countries, Argentina and Buenos Aires, one of my favorite cities. I wish I could be there, but thanks to modern technology, uh, we now have Zoom and still uh, are able to connect with people we want to meet. So there's so much happening in marketing uh, that in this short period, I'll try to talk about some of the major developments. Uh, let me start with this. And uh, all this is, is just a front page to say hello to you. Uh, but let me move on to the next page. Here are the five big trends. Sorry, Professor. Uh, sorry, Professor. Uh, uh, you are not sharing the, the screen. Could you? Oh, okay. What do I do to make sure that you share that I share the screen? Uh, go to the downside of your screen and, and of Zoom and just click share. I, I will check with the, our technical. Team. Yeah. What I what I hit what I hit was share screen options. No, here's share screen. Yeah. Now what I did is I then I expanded now, that. I'm now now it's shared. Now it's shared. Okay. Okay. And now and I'm going to just uh, uh, make this a little larger. Yeah. Do you, see, do you see these five developments that I've listed? Yes, yes, we see them. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. And uh, again, greetings to all of the uh, students and faculty and even maybe business people who might be there. Um, 
So let me say I'm going to talk about five different developments. And let me start with the first one, though you don't have to write this down. Uh, but taking notes might make some sense. So you should always, when you're listening to a speaker, have a pencil and paper available. So we'll start by talking about the new idea called entrepreneurial marketing. And what is that about? Well, first of all, we understand that the world is changing very rapidly. That means some businesses are going to be destroyed and some new businesses will emerge and that uh, there will be changing opportunities. As a matter of fact, the two biggest changes are digitalization. And by the way, many small businesses are not digitalized yet. They're analog companies. They're not digital companies. And then it's a not, not enough if your company has become digitalized. Please start using AI, artificial intelligence, in the way you do your work. Uh, it will speed up things and improve things. Now, some companies are not going to change. Maybe they're doing very well without changing. I just worry that the change will overwhelm them later on. So the thing is, I assume that a company is doing good marketing. Namely, it's being professional in its marketing. In other words, a professional marketer has got skills like uh, knowing how to advertise, knowing how to price, knowing how to manage channels of distribution. But you know, everyone is so busy being professional that no one has time to be entrepreneurial. Let's take the sales force as an example. Let's say I, you manage a sales force and you say to every salesman, keep getting in the field and putting pressure on the clients to buy what you're selling and I'm going to judge you by how much you get sold. Now, that means that the sales force has no time for anything but selling. They have no time to think about, hey, what would be a new set of alliances? Maybe we should invade that other business next door and buy it. Who's going to think about being entrepreneurial? So what does it mean to be entrepreneurial is really the question. Well, it means that, first of all, that there are three characteristics. You're, you have someone trying to recognize new opportunities. You have someone who's willing to take some risks. And you have some work of building a network to that new marketplace that is an opportunity. Now, we know that some companies set aside time for some of their people to be entrepreneurial. Take Google. Google says that 20% of its workers can take the time to do what they think would benefit Google without them following the daily rules of getting new business and so on. And you know what? That led Google to come up with Gmail and someone else at Google came up with Google Maps. Someone else came up with AdSense. So leave some time for some people to be entrepreneurial. So let me move on with that. So I'm going to use a chart. And this is from my new book called Entrepreneurial Marketing. And it says that there are two processes going on in a company. One is called the innovative process. Let's look at that top cluster, the horizontal cluster. Namely, I hope your company has some creative ideas. You're thinking about new things. And that of the things you're thinking about, something has popped up as a real innovation that is worth working on. Now, it doesn't work on itself. You need an entrepreneur who's sponsoring that innovation, pressing for that innovation. And you need a leadership from the company's CEO who says, you know, that could be a very big opportunity. I, I will support you. So that is what it takes to have innovation going on in a company. Now, meanwhile, 
the company is doing all of its work mostly on just running business. And that's in that second cluster. It consists of efforts to improve productivity, efforts to improve little things, improvements, you know, they're always available. That's not like innovating, it's just improving, doing something faster and better. And then uh, you have all that professional effort and these prof these professional marketers are managed by a system of managers. Now, those two form the basis of a model that I'm going to discuss with you. But notice, in addition to the two clusters, there's four other words, very important. One word that's hanging down on the upper left is marketing. So we're going to put all of this into marketing. And then look at the word on the far right, lower right, finance. That's going to be very important to the success of marketing. In fact, if you don't have your marketing people and your finance people talking to each other, working together, you're going to fail. Because the finance guy is going to say, the marketing people want our money, but they're not able to do anything helpful with the money. So let's, let's give them less money. So that's one of the tensions in the business, namely marketing and finance. There's another tension. Notice on the lower left is technology. And at the upper right is humanity. How do we, uh, uh, which technologies can we adopt without killing our humanity? Don't tell me that there's enough technology to replace the need for people running a business. It's possible. But in bringing in robots, drones, new technology, let's make sure we're preserving our humanity. If there are robots, let them be allies who we work with to help us rather than as machines to replace us. Okay, this is the big picture in entrepreneur in the book, entrepreneurial marketing. But there's even a bigger picture. Wow. Wish we could do the whole lecture on just entrepreneurial marketing. Because what you see here, we call it the omnibus of marketing, because it has all the factors. You already saw the horizontal thing called C I E L, right? That's for the innovative side of the business. You saw the PIPM, that's for the running of the business. What are these other things? Well, look at the upper left. It sort of sees, it talks about dynamics. Dynamics. What are the dynamics? And I'll show you what the dynamics are. Namely, your company is going to say, what is happening in the economy to technology, to politics? to social and cultural developments in the economy. So we call those the five Ds, the five dimensions. And how will those five dimensions or five drivers, let's call them drivers, how will those five drivers affect change, the four Cs, change, our competitors, our customers, our company? You understand? So. We, the dynamics are, how are these five drivers in the, in, in, in the whole situation going to affect the four Cs, change, competitors, customers, and company? And then we have one more thing. We've got to put together these tools. These are tools for strategy, tactics, and branding. Uh, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. I think all of you know that that's the beginning of choosing your markets to uh, focus on. And then in every market, we have to differentiate and develop the right marketing mix for that market, including good selling. And that must be all supported by good service, good process work, and good value work, which I call the elements. Let's go back just for a moment. So what you have in this omnibus picture is not only the at the upper left, a triangle that says the dynamics, which I told you about, the drivers and the four Cs, 
And then the competitiveness is determined by those seven, nine elements that I mentioned, the nine E elements that would show how competitive you are. And finally, at the very bottom of the chart is, the, is another triangle saying past and an, another triangle saying future. Past, and what's in that past? It's our, what was our return on sales, R over S, and what was the uh, in, internal uh, success uh, for us? And then we have to predict the future, which will be our cash flow, our CF, and our market value. So we, at the bottom, we're talking about what has been our book value up to now, and what do we need and move toward as a cash flow and a market value. Now, I will not say more about this basic model we developed in the book, Entrepreneurial Marketing, because many of the chapters, chapters uh, spell out all of these issues that come up in marketing, and I'll leave it to you. So now, just a note about being innovative anyways. Here are four companies. I love what Shell Oil did. Every uh, Shell Oil wants to hear from its employees about any ideas they have to do a better job moving their at oil and so on. And what they allow an employee to do is give him 15 minutes uh, 10 minutes to make a presentation about a new idea, followed by uh, 15 minutes of questioning by the board members about this new idea. And if it's a, an attractive idea, Shell will give 100000 or maybe up to 600000 for that individual to run with that idea. They have that much confidence that there's an idea that we're worth financing. And here's the fact that of the five largest ideas that Shell came up with that year, four were started by a process of management talking to employees who had ideas. So that's one way to do it. Now, Samsung, Samsung from South Korea, the, the company that makes, of course, not only Kia and Hyundai as automobiles, but that makes your cell phone, uh, and it makes your it makes your washing machine, your dryer. Uh, you know, the their secret is this: just at the moment that they introduce a new product, they've already put a team together to make something better than the new product. You understand? So if they came out with the cell phone. They set up a team to start making a better one than they just launched. Wow. And that's their secret. Then you have some other companies which deliberately want to involve the customers in the making of new products. Think of Harley Davidson. Harley uh, welcomes drivers of their motorcycles to come in to Milwaukee where the R&D work goes on and contribute ideas to making a better motorcycle. Lego feels the same way. Lego says to young kids and to adults, give us ideas. We want to work with you. Now, a further way of getting new ideas is crowdsourcing. You, you put it out to a whole group of people who want to come up with ideas. Uh, Fiat did that when it was launching a new Fiat automobile and it did crowdsourcing. Well, we can't just talk about entrepreneurial work and thinking, but let's move on. The second thing I wanna tell you about is a set of new tools that are transforming marketing. There's the textbook cover. You might see what looks like a brain. If you look closely, the left part is a real human brain. The right part is actually the computer brain. So that's why we chose that illustration. And in this book, V. Kumar and I talk about eight new tools. And we have a chapter on each, a very rich chapter. So if you want to get instantly up on the latest 
technologies uh, read this book. Now, it hasn't come out yet. It's been finished. It will come out in mid-2024. Uh, so we have a whole chapter on artificial intelligence. We have another and separate chapter on the new part of AI called generalized AI, which is when you prompt the computer to write a whole uh, a chapter on something, or to develop an image for an ad, or to even develop a video, a video. You're telling the computer, here, I want a video with the following uh, elements in it, period. And in some minutes, you'll get your video, and you'll, you'll improve it after you see it, and so on. We have a whole chapter on machine learning, which is so critical if you're in marketing, because marketing is moving toward individual marketing, not mass marketing. Not if you if you're going to do mass marketing and it's been working fine, but another way to go is to get more information and data on each person who is a especially your good customers, and you put in their characteristics and and you let the machine, which is full of regression equations, cluster. Uh, analysis, um, highly sophisticated tools, and it will try to draw insight from the data on their on customer behavior. Hopefully, you will see how customers are really driven by their surroundings and behavior to buy what they're buying. So machine learning is the tool to go from the data into insights. Now, another chapter is on IoT, the Internet of Things, uh, sensors. Sensors are going to connect uh, so much behavior. Uh, for example, I'm in my car and I press a button and the garage door opens. Well, it depended on having a, uh, a, a sensing tools that will open the garage door. So IoT is uh, going to penetrate the whole economy. We should, we need an understanding that there's not only the reality we live in, there are realities that can be created called metaverses. And, and it means that someone has created a metaverse where you can enter, you could uh, put on a certain, a certain costume, uh, and, you can end, and you can buy things and sell things in the metaverse using a fake currency, an artificial currency, which would be translatable to the actual francs or, 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 or dollars or whatever. And so basically, uh, you, we spend the whole chapter on how to be part of the metaverse, a metaverse, and how to operate. Uh, blockchain, I won't say much more, but that's a very important new accounting uh, system in a sense to trace how all of your purchases and sales and so on and have a, a clear record no one can anyone can see but no one can tamper with uh, drones are going to play a bigger role in marketing and so will ro robots and robotics I was in a restaurant recently where the waitress was a robot and uh, the robot took the order and brought us the food. Okay, enough for what I call transformative marketing. Let's move on. Let's move on to what we call H2H marketing. And let's see if I, oh, let's see what it is. Um, here's the customer base view. And it's, it's actually a big, a, treatment of marketing with three new elements that are being discussed in a deeper way than the normal textbook. One is what is added by good design thinking. Very important. Design is, is, is one must be a designer as a marketer, especially an entrepreneurial marketer. And then all services are very important, and in fact, most products are really just uh, instruments, physical instruments that render service. So think always not of the physical instruments so much as the service results and outcomes that you're looking for. And then make sure you digitalize your systems. 
And much can be said about, now the reason we call it H2H is to remind you it is human to human marketing. It is uh, uh, people selling and buying from other people. And to have a good wish to be almost a servant of their desires. Your customers have desires. You would like to trade with them. Their money will be traded to your offerings. So you want to create offerings that will make their lives better. H2H marketing is uh, the basic concept there. Uh, okay, let's uh, move on with this diagram. Very interesting. It's a diagram that starts with like what I call the five A's. By the way, this is worked out in one of our books called uh, Marketing 5.0. Namely, when I want a new customer, I first of all have to make that person aware of us against so many other competitors. Uh, and then in a way that makes them find us appealing, some someone to sort of know more about. And the result of those two steps is to have the person sort of ask us questions more quick because we haven't done much, much, much but created awareness and appeal, but there's so many things they need to know about us. So we have to anticipate the questions that they will ask and then to act on those questions and, and, and go further and uh, get them to buy repeatedly from us. So those are the digital touch points. Now, notice what I'm going to do here. By the way, the ultimately, the last stage is to have them become an advocate, a person who buys again and again from us, and also tells others how good we are as a company. Now, I want to connect these. Notice what I'm doing. Well, let's so far... I, I I think I use public relations to get some people aware of us. Then I did some radio, TV, and print. And, and I was hoping to start word of mouth marketing through the print and so on. And yes, it came out that there were banner ads. And I created a website. And I, and I chose some social media to increase the appeal. And I even created a contact center where they can find out more about us. And I reached their family and friends. And then I worked with a store to make the goods available in, in that store. And I, I can, I, there's a whole system. So what you're looking at are two things, digital touch points and physical touch points. So what is marketing about? It's about a journey. And the journey is getting a person aware, finding your company's appealing, asking questions, getting answers to the questions, buying, and then becoming a long-term customer. Very important chart. That's the journey. Okay. Now I want to move to... One other aspect that we, we stress in, in marketing, um, in the H2H marketing, you don't want your marketing to be wasteful. There's, there's a lot of ways to uh, make an investment in something and it doesn't pan out. Uh, we don't want inane marketing. Inane marketing is silly marketing. Uh, Silly things that are done as if they're cute and they're worth doing, but you find out they weren't. Nor should any of your marketing be unethical, lying, disinformation. So what you really want to achieve is, is you know, marketing it really adds value to people and steering away from unethical, wasteful, and inane marketing. And we do a lot with that idea in our book, H2H Marketing. Now, the next big development in marketing is the addition of sustainability. Wow. Uh, up to now, we said that every company should just grow, grow, grow its business. However, the more you grow your business, the more you're causing the climate to warm because you are exuding 
into the air, substances and uh, uh, that are warming the atmosphere. And now we are noticing more hurricanes and floods and fires and all that bad news. And uh, <clears throat> so economic, endless economic growth can lead to a warming planet. And when that happens, people in the worst areas, namely where the equator is, are going to flee. They're going to run into Europe if they can't get there, or the U.S. or Australia. They want to get away from the heat, and that's a, <clears throat> going to be a huge problem. So we want to get more business firms to not only to pursue profitability, to but to balance it with, at the same time, uh, sustainability. And I'll explain sustainability in, in a moment, but my argument is the companies that practice both do better than the ones that only focus on profit. Uh, there's evidence of that. So companies need to reduce waste, put greening work in, and environment work in their business and, uh, and make goods that last a long time. Um, it costs some money in the short run, but it will increase your competitiveness in the long run. Uh, specifically, please use water more carefully because um, Coca-Cola couldn't exist without water. And they know it, and they're spending a lot to conserve water now. Uh, use more efficient electrical vehicles because uh, they are not going to pollute the air with the fuels that we normally use, uh, the gas and oil. Uh, drive less. Uh, if you can, and fly less, and Zoom more, do more Zooming. In other words, I'm being a good guy by doing a Zoom to you and not flying all the way to Argentina. Uh, reduce packaging and plastics. Wow. By the way, there's an issue there because I told someone that in the supermarket, they said, do you want plas plastic bags or paper bags? I said, paper. I felt better because paper... We want to get rid of plastics. He says, but you know, then you're killing trees and trees absorb a lot of the bad emissions. Wow. So what is the best uh, way as an as a environmentalist? I have to understand what is good and what isn't. Lower my heating and lighting costs in offices and factories. Now, that leads us uh, partly to the concept of a, a circular economy. Now, a linear economy uh, is, is the one we've always run. Take some, take something, take some resources, make something from the resources, sell the product and dispose of it and have a mountain of junk being piled up. Dispose. Well, we need a circular economy that minimizes the resources we need. There's no waste if possible, no bad emissions if possible. Uh, and the resources are renewable and I, I can recycle them. I can use them a second time. And so that is the new thinking uh, of um, preserving the value of our resources and reusing them, refining them, recycling them and so on. Reuse, repair, and remanufacture. That is very important. And I just have this statement. 89% of executives agree that there is a global climate emergency. And many of them are purpose-driven companies uh, that are growing very well by even practicing sustainability. Uh, even when you want uh, to hire new people, uh, they want to work for a company that cares about the, the pollution, that cares about a better environment, and they're, they're not going to go to your business if you don't seem to care about that. And the consumers are going to choose the companies that are practicing more sustainability, not just profit-making uh, results. Which leads to a whole big question. If we cannot make the economy of Argentina just keep growing, growing, and growing at the harm of the planet. Do we stop by 
do we go from a growth mentality to a degrowth mentality? Well, there's some people who favor that. I'm not going to say, no, stop growing company, your company. Uh, but you got to be aware of this. The world population grew from 3 billion people in 1960 to um, now 9 billion people. Uh, and that was a very rapid growth. Uh, and the question is, is the, does the earth have the caring capacity in terms of food, shelter, and, and clothing for that growing population? And in fact, this was argued in the 1970s in that famous long-term debate on the limits to growth, which had a big simulation system to show that we were going to hurt the economy and ourselves if we don't slow down in our growth rate. Uh, and in fact, the book came out in 2019 by Christopher Tucker, and he says the right population of the world would be 3 billion people, not 9 billion people. Now, uh, look, you may just say that's so silly. We have not, you're not going to kill the, the, the excess population. No, he is saying that a realistic view of how to have deliver a good life to the people on the earth is when you have 3 billion people with the resources and the incomes being more shared than exploited by a few billionaires and so on. In other words, he was trying to say, if, if we turn more to degrowth uh, and more sharing of everyone's sharing in a good life, uh, we don't need as many people on earth. I mean, you don't want to just, I mean, maybe we'll, we should go from 9 billion people to uh, 100 billion people. What's, what's, a, what's the appropriate population that the earth can support? And in his in the book uh, in 2020, Jason Hickel, with the title of the book, Less is More, How Degrowth Wins uh, with, with Save the World. So he's advocating uh, uh, less advertising. Wow, that's not good for the marketing people. Here, I'm trying to help you as marketers. And he says, let's advertise. Less planned obsolescence, namely, why does... Uh, Apple have to put out a new Apple cell phone uh, when the one I have works and, and the new one doesn't add much, but they just need to make another, they have to plan their obsolescence. Uh, less ownership and more sharing of assets and more recovering, reusing and recycling. So there's that doctrine of degrowth. Uh, I'm going to end uh, in a minute or two. Uh, I did publish a book recently on what is called social marketing. And social marketing is a corrective of, of some phases of bad commercial marketing. For example, what if I get you to, to keep smoking cigarettes? Well, social marketing would be campaigns, marketing campaigns to help you stop smoking. By understanding why girls of uh, 15 are starting to smoke when they don't need to. You know, when industry glamorizes smoking or drug abuse or alcoholism, where everyone has to drink alcohol, we've got to have a corrective. And social marketing is the use of marketing to correct some bad things done by normal marketing. And we call the thing a demarketing. So social marketing is actually putting into effect some demarketing or using marketing to get people to stop using something that is hurtful to them. Okay, so that book is a has a hundred case studies of successful social marketing. You might want to look at that book. So, what is my conclusion? Industry will be based in the future and should be based on private ownership, of course, capitalism. Look, I'm for capitalism completely, but I want a better capitalism, not a free market capitalism with no responsibilities to our health and welfare. I want a better capitalism and it would be stakeholder capitalism, first of all, 
not just a capitalism that is only rewarding the investors, the shareholders. It gives good return to the workers, to the distributors, the suppliers, and so on. Uh, and that we have to have charge higher taxes, not to everyone, not to those who don't have much income, but to those who have a lot of income, we need to charge them higher taxes. We have to accept some unions to give voice to the company about policy choices that will affect the employees. And we should look for capitalist models in the Nordic countries, which I think have achieved the best versions of capitalism because uh, they have achieved the highest living standards. If you say what companies have the highest health in their population, the population is the happiest population. They have the most educated people and the lowest income disparity. We're talking about Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and um, Iceland. Uh, Finland keeps winning the happiest country in the world, even though, even though they deny it in some way. So if companies adopt Nordic business philosophy, which is capitalistic, but it's a certain kind of capitalism that is aiming to make citizens happier, healthier, better educated, and enjoying uh, a good livable income. Mm -hmm. So I'm ending now with just a summary that I talked and shared with you five trends. That marketing needs to become more entrepreneurial. It has to become more transformative with new tools, eight tools, which I talked about. H2H marketing puts our focus on people to people, dealing with each other and adding value to each other. And all in the context of a sustainable marketing, so that we don't hurt the climate and the world, and that maybe we need a little less excessive growth and more, uh, more reasonable growth in our planning. That's it, folks. Those are some of the trends affecting marketing, and I thank you for listening to me. Um, thank you, Professor Kotler. Now we go to the question and answers. There is a problem with the, the sound. Uh, Francisco, we are not hearing your microphone. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Professor Kotler, but you are not hearing uh, the auditorium. Uh, yeah, no. but I, if, if someone asks a question and yes. you hear the question, you could ask the question of okay. me. Yeah. Fran Francisco will, will do the questions. Francisco? Mm. No, we are not listening the microphone, Francisco, online. Could you change the microphone? microphone? Just a second, Professor Kotler. Uh, we have several questions. <laughs> we, we will have limited time, of, of course. Uh, thank you so much. In the meanwhile, I, I, I would like to tell you that uh, this presentation is a summary for the next 10 years PhD thesis <laughs> research program <laughs> for uh, University of Austral and others. We have universities connected here with us from Spain, Mexico, different countries in, in Latin America, and also from Europe. Uh, well, my, my brother is in, in Latvia, you know, it's... Uh, Latvia, yes, I know. <laughs> So, so they, they are connected also. And, okay, so we have several things to, to think about. Um, but just a second, we are I just having a problem with the I want to check mic. if Professor yeah. Kotler can hear me now. Yeah, yeah. I now can hear you. Okay. So I was just uh, presenting myself. Uh, my name is Francisco Aldaya. I'm a business and economy reporter here at BloombergLinia.com. Um, so let's just get started with the questions. The first one is um, regarding the, the new generations of, of marketers that are coming up, especially in developing countries. 
Could you tell us your top three tips for them to become great disciples of Philip Kotler? <laughs> well, uh, they don't have to be a disciple of me. Uh, there's a lot of great marketers writing their views of what works. But for them to be successful, first of all, they must become more aware of digital of the digital revolution. Um, and that is to become comfortable with the tools of the digital revolution. And then if they want to stand out a lot, I think they should read that book uh, on on uh, what we call uh, the, 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 the marketing or the, the one with the omnibus model, because what we try to do in the entrepreneurial marketing book is have a model that doesn't neglect key things such as humanity, technology, marketing, finance, and, and then the creative process, and then the productive process. Let me make an observation. Uh, Japan uh, got along very well with some creativity initially. Remember, they were the ones who invented Walkman. Maybe you don't know Walkman anymore because you're so used to the cell phone. But but much of Japanese thinking about uh, became just to improve things, not not having a big it because they haven't had a big idea. Samsung is the one with big ideas. And Samsung learned from the Japanese and, and became more Japanese in the process. So it's not enough just to improve what you're doing as a company. It's about uh, coming up with some, some bigger ideas. All right. Um, uh, so uh, now if you want to be a marketer and if you have quantitative abilities, please go into um, AI because your company can benefit greatly. The one you, you, you join can benefit greatly by being moved toward more AI thinking and maybe more robotic thinking too um, because that's where the action is. That's what's missing from companies. They don't have the people who have stayed with digital and AI enough to get the benefits of that. So choose a company to work with uh, that is looking very much for someone with the skill set that I mentioned in this talk. Uh, but remember, it's always people to people. Remember, this design thinking and, and, and digitalization and services. Service is so key as a differentiator. And there's a, a lot of places that will sell you detergent, right? Uh, but is there some more creative ways to make detergents available to people? Uh, uh, and, and, and always think about how a company can be improved profitably, but not only profitably. Profit comes from having found new ways to create value. The big mantra of marketing is we're in the business of creating value, of satisfying, making lives be more satisfying to people. Uh, Any other questions? Yes, yes, there's several. So the following question is, uh, if we were to think about a future uh, researcher wanting to do a, a PhD thesis on your body of works, on your theory as a whole, where should he start? Well, um, you got to make a choice uh, of a dissertation topic that you think will be uh, very interesting. Uh, for example, if you got fascinated with the idea of degrowth, can you do a thesis to show the relationship between um, uh, ways to have effective growth, salutary growth, good growth, and can you spot, can you almost research where we are as a society wasting resources, misusing resources? In other words, spotlight what is good growth, which we want more of, 
and spotlight what is bad growth. It's uh, it's almost remember that diagram that said marketing could be um, uh, wasteful. Uh, it could be in, inane, silly, uh, or or maybe, and, and all that. We we want the right kind of uh, marketing and creativity to to come out of our work. We have a question now from one of my fellow colleagues at uh, Cronista, which is a business and economy newspaper here in Argentina. Uh, and it's the following. How do companies uh, start using degrowth, degrowth marketing and how should it help them in their goal towards profitability? Yes, uh, the real question, it's a good question because is it a respons the responsibility of a company to change its growth rate, or is it the responsibility of this of the country to figure out how to incentivize good growth versus discourage bad growth? In other words, maybe the individual company can be impressed with the idea of degrowth, but it, it wants growth. So maybe that's an area that is a matter of public policy where you know, maybe um, just passing, just doing uh, more demarketing is important. Now, demarketing means we don't want water shortages. Please look what San Francisco did. San Francisco had a water crisis, and they said maybe we shouldn't have grass lawns. You know, you're 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 planting grass. How about just lawns that have gravel? Uh, now, gravel that means you, you, you're you're not cutting the grass. You're you're not. Uh, uh, in other words, the point is demarketing. I believe that there will be as much demarketing work going on in the future as there is marketing work. Yeah, wow! Quote me on that that the marketing of abusive uses of resources to get to cut down that behavior through the marketing take alcohol we have too many people just getting inebriated driving cars having car accidents uh losing their productivity uh, how do we get people to stop using drugs and alcohol and uh, cigarettes? Uh, three causes of great, awful things happening people to people. How do we use marketing for good? That kind of marketing, we need more of, and we need less of the marketing, hey, drink some more alcohol. So following that line of questioning um, or questions, there's uh, a lot of political currents around the world that are questioning or uh, not believing in climate change. Do companies have a responsibility to educate about this topic, both internally and externally? Yeah, you know, uh, those against the idea that climate change is a problem Obviously, our companies that make a lot of money uh, by producing things that the climate change people want to hurt or eliminate. Yeah, so it, it's it's not coming. So I remember going to a talk by a uh, a statistician who uh, goes around the country showing that climate change is fake. It's not real. And he, he throws dozens of numbers and statistics. He's been hired by that industry, by the industry people who want to continue to um, make money. To it's full of disinformation. His statistics are so challengeable, but audiences fall for it. They they gave him a, they give him a large uh, applause after he's finished uh, to feel so good that there is no climate change problem really. So what's gonna hurt a lot of us is what is called disinformation. Um, by the way, I'm reading about not only that, when I see pictures 
You remember, there, we used to say there's so much truth in a picture. So many, so you'll learn so much without words. You can't trust pictures anymore. A generative AI can make a picture of me uh, that even a, showing me advocating no sustainability. Kaku says there's no such thing as needing sustainability. And, and, and so we're got to be educated in, it's not that easy to know whether a, a well-known person really said that. How do you, how do you afterwards convince people who are now onto other things to forget what they saw? It wasn't true. So we're in a very uh, new world that has produced great new things and great bad things too. So uh, going back to business marketing, could you name some strategies or, or tactics, uh, suggestions to implement in small companies uh, in Argentina or in other Latin American countries, um, considering the difficulties that they're facing in terms of, of human capital today? Well, you know, I, I value small businesses and I feel so worried about them. When Walmart comes into a city in the United States, it will kill from 12 to 20 businesses because the people who went to that baker, bakery shop or butcher shop or so on now goes to Walmart, which has everything you need. And, uh, and I tell small businesses, please be sure you're very distinctive in what you're offering that is not gonna be found in Walmart. So if you're a bakery, yeah, Walmart will have good bakery products but they don't have that particular set of biscuits or uh, flavors or whatever. Uh, we want the big to exist and the small to exist. Actually, want to debate this. I mean, should most uh, business be in coming in the hands of a few very big WalMarts and and and, and, and Amazons and so on? Now look at look at Amazon. Americans are basically almost everyone placing an order always with Amazon for anything they need because they, Amazon has access to everything made by, they'll soon have even buying a car through as Amazon, <laughs> that they will represent cars that you can buy directly. Uh, that's good, there's some good in that. But at the same time, uh, I, we all look back with with great uh, nostalgia about when we used to go to a bakery that now has disappeared, where they knew who we were. See, what we're losing is our humanity. Professor Kotler, the, the role of the small businesses is to pr protect our humanity. Well, maybe I can't take any more questions uh, because there's a lot to think about. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. We have uh, several more questions. Uh, would you like to proceed? Well, let's take two more and, okay. and cut it at that point. <laughs> Sounds good. So uh, regarding uh, marketing in the entertainment business and the importance of, uh, of, of marketing in the budgets of, of, of films, right? For Netflix, for Max, what is your view currently on that? that uh, industry in particular? Well, uh, <clears throat> entertainment is, uh, is a fantastic part of the uh, society's uh, pleasures and so on. And uh, there's much more, you know, film is now and videos. Uh, the big thing happen uh, happening is now uh, what's, what's what we call streaming. I, I, and, and that's simply something my, my wife and I are into now when we are settling into an evening of, of enjoying an entertainment. We uh, select a, a series that may have uh, 40, uh, 10 or 15 episodes and, uh, and no, no marketer can get back to us because we 
actually chose to pay three ninety nine for the uh, for each episode, and um, we're not available for even ads. See, here's the thing: marketing has to be changing, regardless. Uh, two things: advertising. Um, we're we we can learn about any product much more uh, now than from the advertising of the product. I see a product, it looks interesting. I go to my cell phone, I read more about it. I see how it was made. I see who the competitors are. So it diminishes the role of just having an ad in front of me about that particular product. Now, the same with Salesforce. How big a Salesforce does the company need? Um, some sales for, for example, in the pharmaceutical business, um, the uh, salesman uh, comes to talk about a new uh, pharmaceutical product to, to, to a doctor. And the uh, assistant uh, nurse says, you can't see our doctor, he's too busy. Uh, just leave uh, the brochure and a sample of the product. And he'll read about it and get back to you if he has any questions. In other words, they're saying, uh, you can't see the doctor. Well, then what about persuasion and information? And does the doctor ever really look at what we left except to give out our samples to some of the customers? Um, how many salespeople uh, do, do we need uh, in an age where information is so abundant about anything that you could pretty much buy more? Our consumers are more intelligent than they've ever been about what the values really are when they're considering buying a car, uh, buying a refrigerator or stove or anything like that. And, uh, and, and so we're not back at the time when we were all ignorant and we saw a refrigerator and there was only one to buy or two maybe, and we didn't know much more. So the responsibility today is with the consumer and and the role of the marketing mix it still has power but even there we have to be better at branding smarter at pricing and and the winners are those who will lock in on channels of distribution where they are guaranteed the shelf space to show their product if you if the only if you're a food producer and you can't get the food into super into grocery stores and and convince the owner that your brand will be more attractive than those occupying the shelf, you're not going to get shelf space and you're going to have to go by to, to vending machines and 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 gas stations to sell your brand because you're closed out of the uh, the uh, public uh, groceries. Anyways, marketing's face will change. Its, its purpose will change. Its, its tools will change. Uh, it's, and and, and we, we have to be ready for, for adapting to the new world. Professor Kotler, Please spend a lot of time with, spend a lot of time with finance because all the big decisions are made by people with a financial mindset. The companies are run by finance, not by marketing. Get to work closely with them. And I remember a good friend of mine who is the head of marketing uh, of um, the company Master Master Charge. You know, there's Visa and, and the Master Company. And he did a great thing by working with the finance person to actually figure out Every time they, they get someone to start using MasterCard, uh, the role, how to measure the market share influenced by marketing. He and the finance guy worked together to get a system where they didn't have to defend marketing because they could see what it was doing. And that's what the, the case with social media. You should try out Facebook. Instagram, uh, and other ones, try them out. Those that don't work, stop using them. 
those that do work, use them more. Social media is got to be one of your abilities now in the marketing world. Professor Kotler, final question, and then I'll just ask you, if possible, to uh, give us some final concluding comments. So the following question is from Bioceres, which is one of the most innovative companies in Argentina working on um, crop solutions, and it's listed in and trades in the U.S. stock market. So what role do marketing professionals play in this digital revolution where sometimes instead of being more connected, we're losing out a little on how uh, we communicate or, or the, the way we communicate is changing. For example, uh, Apple goggles, the metaverse, um, we're all seemingly in our own little bubble now. Yes. Um, I, you know, marketing is going to have to center on a job position and and the one we've chosen is called the uh, uh, the uh, CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, so around the world now, most of the marketing work is done by Chief Marketing Officers. Now that's uh, a, a new thing because sales management was dominant in managing the marketing of companies, especially business to business marketing is, is very sales oriented, sales force oriented. But, but it turns out that instead of the vice president of sales running marketing, it became the, uh, a, a broader function. It's, 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 it started with the four P's, you know, product, price, place, and promotion. Now I, that's the marketing mix. But now it's broader. There's seven elements to the marketing mix in, in what we call a newer marketing mix, where we not only add, have price, but we have incentives as another element. Not only do we have product, we, but we also have service, even though it doesn't begin with a P. Not only do we have uh, a product, we have brand as an element. So there are seven elements, and um, that's what is has put marketing on the map of companies that it manages those seven elements and yes it's not and yet it's not satisfying to some people and they say we shouldn't have a so much a uh, chief marketing officer we need a chief growth officer because what is marketing about it's about ensuring more and more growth so, all right, some companies now have changed the name, or they might have a, a chief customer officer, um, and so on. But I would say that there's a fraternity uh, of chief marketing officers, CMOs, that are trading ideas with each other. So, yes, you could have a chief growth officer, that, that could be fine, or chief resource officer, or whatever. But, but the talk is between CMOs with each other. How do I measure the amount of marketing share we've affected? How do I use pricing better? So it's, there's a fraternity there. And, um, and, the, and the reason I raise this question is um, make sure that your, your, your company uh, is managing um, where marketing is well perceived as adding value to the business. Once finance convinces the chief executive that marketing isn't working well, and it is not working well in some companies, there's going to be a problem until finance is happy with the marketing group. And, the, and, and that is the central either building relationship that will build a company or destroy a company when marketing and finance don't get along. So I think much of the point of my talk now has been there's a new marketing taking place, new skill sets, and don't, don't neglect them. Move with what's happening in marketing. And it's our books and 
our articles and our journal articles that are producing new findings that you need to be sensitive to. Well, I, I wish every company in uh, Argentina uh, success in a, in a world of uh, with many tough things happening and disturbing things happening, but we need clearer thinking on the part of every company about their purpose. Go back to this, always. Don't just set goals and so on. What is the purpose of your company? That what do you think you're adding by having such a business? If there's if there's 40, 40 other companies making clothing, I hope you're making clothing that is needed and not just like everyone else's clothing. Okay. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you so much, Professor Kotler. Uh, your presentation, your question and answers uh, were so illuminating and also generous. Uh, so we will have this as well the illumination or the ideas for the next years of this uh, new ecosystem in marketing in Universidad Austral. And well, we hope to, to do a, a good job as educators, educating the new uh, generations of uh, marketers. Uh, for those who are uh, interested on the, on the books of Philip Kotler, uh, well, you, you will find him in several uh, social media and um, the publisher's websites. Uh, but for those questions that were not included in the question and answer session, you, can, you could send to us. Uh, so we perhaps uh, send to Professor Kotler and, and the other speakers. We, would like to thank to all the speakers, participants, organizers, especially to Francisco Aldaya from Bloomberg and Linea and the authorities of Universidad Austral. But finally, thank you again, Professor Kotler. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Forge, uh, who was a friend who introduced me to Professor Kotler. And just ending uh, saying that well, this is a dream that was made uh, reality. Um, uh, we are Argentinian, so having Professor Kotler here with us, it's like having Messi, <laughs> Lionel Messi uh, with us. Uh, so thank you. Universal Australia is your home and see you next time. Thank you, thank you and good luck to everyone. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.